So uh, I'll guess we'll go ahead and go around the horn. Uh, I'll start with uh, Buena Buen since he is a uh, top left. Go ahead and uh, reintroduce yourself to anybody who doesn't know you already. Hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Buena Buen. I stream here on Twitch. Um, uh, just hanging out tonight, having a, some conversation. Um, yeah. Beautiful, sweet, and simple. Gremlo, you're next. Yeah, um, I'm Gremlo. I stream also here on Twitch, uh, Monday through Friday. We do news and politics. I'm a sociology student in Louisiana. <laughs> so uh, we talk about a lot of social and cultural issues on here. And uh, this Saturday, we're doing a 24 hour charity uh, fundraiser for Trans Lifeline. Awesome. Thank you for uh, plugging that stream. Definitely we'll uh, replug it again at the end of the segment tonight. Hell yeah. Um, I guess I'm next on my screen. So uh, I'm Marcus. I stream here on Twitch uh, by the internet handle homozygote. I'm a third year PhD student in molecular biology at the University of Vermont. Uh, I do neuroscience, but I have a big microbiology background too. So I basically just do a lot of general bio, uh, a lot of COVID content, but uh, certainly delve into other areas as well. Uh, Professor EXP, you're next. Sure. Uh, professor EXP, I'm a professor of sociology. Um, at a school just outside of Boston. I also teach courses on experience design, like user experience and customer experience. And I live, I stream on Twitch Mondays 12 to like around 3 Eastern time, Fridays 9 a.m. till around noon Eastern time, and then Saturdays around 7 to 10 p.m. Eastern time, where we usually do some kind of game with a social or psychological or cultural angle to it. Awesome. And that leaves me. So you. I'm uh, Professor Q on uh, Twitch. There was a problem when I created my handle. I'm sure some of you are wondering. So I have to wait like two more weeks and then I get to play around with it again. So the same um, thing, by the way, I changed oh, my name. So I'm, I was right there with you because uh, I had a, I had my my initials. Then I was like, that's dumb. And then EXP came to me in a flash of brilliance. And so I had to do the same thing. So I'm right there with you. But uh, I'm a visiting assistant professor at the University of Missouri, Columbia, and I teach sociology, sociology of sport, drugs in society, all the fun stuff. Very cool. All right. Uh, I think, Professor Q, you posted in our sort of behind the scenes chat uh, a very salient discussion topic that I think uh, would make for some good conversation, right? Because a lot of the <clears throat> existence of our Ministry of Science, this is our fourth gathering, uh, is predicated upon a lot of uh, academics, scientists, uh, even physicians, uh, sort of not necessarily sort of, quote unquote, exiting the ivory tower uh, to you know, interact, converse, communicate with uh, the rest of the folks in our communities and the people around us, generally speaking. So uh, maybe you could just go ahead and open up the floor really to anybody who wants to start to maybe just comment on, you know, do you even agree that's a, some a phenomenon happening around us uh, and maybe some you know, introductory reasons as to why you think that might be? Well, maybe some one way we could kind of pivot this a little bit yeah, to continue on our, our topic of redlining, right? Is there very much is redlining in academia, right? So um, one of the sins of sociology, right, is about how, um, scholars of color have been marginalized in the discipline going all the way back to Du Bois and um, how he was, you know, had to fund his own research. He wasn't really considered part of the, the sociology crowd. Um, and, uh, you know, that's also true for women, right? So Professor XP was talking about this the other day, Jane Addams, right? right. She, um and, and also, you know, uh, queer scholars um, and first generation scholars, too. Um, yeah, it's a it's a huge one. And when I was mentioning Jane Addams. Um, one of the things that I, I was former president of is something called the Association for Applied and Clinical Sociology. And one of the reasons I got into sociology in the first place was because I thought it was something useful that I could do good with. It wasn't because of all the, you know, the um, the fancy accommodations and the luxurious lifestyle and the huge pay. That was not what drew me in. It was that this seems like really useful. And I was in a Marxist undergraduate department. Everyone was really activist oriented. 
And then when I did my PhD, it was still like uh, people were working full time while doing their PhDs in real jobs. Not everyone wanted to be in academia. They wanted to do something with their degrees and their knowledge, which is really different than a most of academia, right? I mean, it's sad but true that a lot of social science mm-hmm. and arts and sciences is just you know more fixated on trying to prove itself as legitimate versus mm-hmm. trying to have impact in people's lives. And you look at someone like Jane <clears throat> Adams, where social work, Hull House, emerged out of her, ex- essentially her exile from the University of Chicago for being too active, you know, being too engaged in communities, or Du Bois, right, being too engaged. So part of it, I think, is, you know, has to do with race and gender and sexual orientation, but I also think part of it has to do with the fact that they were trying to do something with it because they didn't have the privilege to sit back and do nothing with it. You know, that's like my own kind of like theory or hypothesis about it. But, the, you know, you see this undercurrent of if you do applied work as an academic, you are less than. And if you are a person of color or a woman or a person who's LGBTQ, mm-hmm. you want to do something with it because you, you know the needs of your, of your communities from which you come. And that's verboten in academic work. And I, this has plagued me my whole career about, you know, I got into it because I was, I was seeing all this stuff going on around me. I was like, Hey, like, this is sociology. I can, you know, apply the framework here. And so all of my projects are something that I've personally invested in. Um, and it's so sad to, to, to go back and to read, um, you know, I mean, Mill, C. Wright Mills to read, uh, right. you know, Du Bois and, and his history and, and find out that, you know, we're still just in this cycle, right? Um, Absolutely. So let me ask you all a question. What do you think the, it, it's not only um, the fact that they were marginalized people, um, but the there's a power structure there that's for some reason pushing them to be on the margins. Right. And so Mm -hmm. what's the objection of the power structure in having these people do this type of research? What, why, what do they object about it? I think part of it, a big part of it it has been early in sociology's existence. It was trying to justify itself as a quote unquote, real hard science. And so the, you know, the idea of that was we need to be a quote unquote objective, whatever the hell that means. And that we also need to be quantitative, even though Chicago, again, Robert right. Park was a journalist, um, you for Chicago, you know, they did a lot of qualitative work. And we need to, we need to replicate work that's been done in other academic fields that already have um, acceptance. And so right. I, I don't know that it was like a, the power structure feeling threatened by their work as much as it was um, little brother, little sister syndrome of trying to say, you know, hey, we're like, you know, we're, we're important, we're worthwhile, and we need to therefore, you know, replicate these academic structures that are removed from people's real lives. Now, I'm so, not saying yeah, it they, wasn't well, the power structure stuff either, but I'm saying that there was also this other element yeah. of sociology trying to <laughs> prove itself by rendering itself um, irrelevant. Right. The same thing happened with psychology. Right. Um, you know, they decided, I don't know when it was, um, but when when a lot of the different philosophy of science debates were going on as to what it was science and what was pseudoscience, and you had people out now calling fields like sociology and psychology and anthropology and these other uh non-hard sciences fields um pseudoscience right and so they just you know the people in charge i guess decided that the way to gain legitimacy is to become quantitative and reductive Mm. and set up experimentation and be able to have your theories predict things in certain ways and Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that that happened to psychology um, probably in the last century um, right. when they gave away from the clinical Freudian and Jungian psychoanalytic stuff to 
more experimentation and BF Skinner and right and those types of folks. I have a the theory on that. I think yeah. what we need to do in sociology is we just need to go out and buy white lab coats and just make sure we have white lab coats <laughs> on. Because, hey, sorry, that's that's just a little joke. You know, it rem- yeah, reminds yeah. me of that meme. You know, stop trying to make it happen. It's never going to happen. They're never going to accept <laughs> us. It doesn't matter what we do. It's better to be who yep. we are because it's just not going to stop trying to make it happen. It's just not going to happen. And, you know, at the, that and I think we see the breaking. One of the things that's happening, I've been talking to some friends about this. We see more younger academics leaving academia. Mm-hmm. Right. A lot. And so and, or people deciding not to go into it because of its failed promise. And I'm an academic, I guess, um, and that's where I work. But and I like it, but at the same time, I'm in a pretty good position. I, if I was in a regular department, I don't know if I could stick it out. I might have to figure out, and I would go somewhere else because of because of that reductionism, because of that you know mm-hmm. uh, self-imposed irrelevance that so many sociologists you know constrict themselves with. And that's such a Are shame. You- Sorry. Hi. Um, <laughs> I'm a very serious uh, political streamer, as you can see. But um, my my academic background is in um, economics, and even there, um, it can be really frustrating because it is in this bizarre kind of unique intersection of um, STEM, like hard sciences. But then also, you know, when you look at economics in any way where it can be applied, it has to take note of things like sociology, of maybe what some people would call the softer sciences. Um, and yeah, there's there's a certain degree of maybe um, a, a perception of, oh, well, they're not as credible as something else. And I think it, it breaks my heart when I hear people talk about sociology in that way, because I mean, for, I now work in politics Um, and political strategy. And I mean, sociology is the beautiful thing that ties everything together and explains like you can have all these theories on, you know, macroeconomic theory and expansion and psych look at psychology and actual like neuropsychology, neurobiology. But when all of that comes together and it's like, okay, well then in society, what does that mean? Or what are the other um, phenomena that can be, can help explain some of these things? That's sociology, and right. and it's a shame that it's so discounted <laughs> because it is highly relevant. <laughs> so, yeah, it was really also it was it was really cool when economics discovered people and uh, <laughs> economists started winning Nobel prizes for it. They're like, holy <laughs> shit! You mean people make decisions not based on rational choice, but like other stuff? I'm like, what? Yeah, I know Nobel prize. <laughs> I, I know. And, and you know, I'm not diminishing all They're the like great work. They're like groundbreaking. Yeah, I was like, you read this stuff, you're like, okay. And but that's like, you know, always like this, 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 this experience of being a sociologist is that you read how people discover what you, your people have been looking at for like a hundred years. Right. And exactly. All the time, you're like, oh well, I'm glad you finally showed up. And then they, and then like they don't even <laughs> cite you. They like, oh, I found this. They're like, okay, Columbus. Um, congratulations. <laughs> we're, we were living here before then. It's so totally. funny how that sentiment is echoed in this week again, because last week when talking to Neuro Fourier, a uh, neurologist who works for the CDC, said the exact same thing when he was talking to an anthropologist friend who, who was like, we've been saying this for decades that something like this was going to happen. Yeah. yeah. I have a quick story, um, if I can. It's, it's what I call the open house problem. And I work at a private business school. And when we have like these events where prospective students come to campus and each department has their table set up in this big room. And we're usually next to the philosophy table, keeping each other company because no one wants to talk to us. <laughs> and the number one question I get during this event is where's the bathroom? Seriously. That's the number one question I get is where's the bathroom? And then I show them where the bathroom is. And the number two question is what does sociology have to do with business? And I used to just look at people and say everything and then say nothing else. Um, and then I found this really great quote by this guy named Simon Sinek, who wrote a bunch of books, such as, you know, the start with why. Yep. Mm-hmm. And his quote was, uh, customers are people, employees are people. If you don't understand people, you don't understand business. 
And so I just printed out that quote with a picture of him and wrote at the bottom, study sociology, understand people. And then when people would come up to me and say, what does sociology have to do with business? I'd hand them the sheet and they go, oh, I'm like, yeah, everything, right? And it's, but you know, it's, it's, I don't blame them. I don't blame them. I blame us mm -hmm. because we're the ones mm -hmm. who have restricted ourselves into this narrow platform, right? That no one else can understand. I, you know, uh, Professor Q said he teaches sociology of sports. I tried to, st I tried to publish in a sociology of sport journal one time. And it was rejected because it was written in too much lay language that anybody could understand. <laughs> what? Are you serious? Yeah. I went, oh, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, it was God. too colloquial. I'm like, I can't, I'm, that's horrible. I can't believe I did that. I mean, yeah. That like, surprises the hell out of me because those people, the North American Sociology of Sport listserv, they are fantastic people. Yeah. They're really yeah. kind. But, oh, man, I'm so Reviewer sorry. Reviewer number two, yeah. man. Reviewer number two. No, always kidding. reviewer number two. Oh, <laughs> reviewer number two sucks. How they that, always suck. I just, how can that be a uh, viable justification for why something can't be published? They're saying it's too colloquial. It's like if if the general populace or a larger <laughs> swath of the population can't understand what you're talking about, then like, are is this just going to be some echo? Like, pardon the the visual here, but like echo chamber echo chamber circle jerk. Like, shouldn't it, isn't it a good thing? Isn't it, shouldn't you get like brownie points for making so you it have, colloquial? You have been to the ASA conference. <laughs> yeah. Because you just described it. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's kind of like that. And it's part of the issue, again, I would be that, and it goes to what you all are doing in terms of professionals or, or uh, public scholarship, right? And why we're on Twitch in the first place is what's impact me and how do we measure it? How do we, before we can measure it, we have to const, we have to constitute it, you know, operational definition. And so if you measure impact solely by, um, you know, journal ranking and uh, citation index, that's a very particular kind of impact measurement that shows you what you care about, which is only yourselves, right? Versus, versus what you all are doing on Twitch, what I try to do on Twitch, which is have public engagement of these kinds of ideas to promote a larger conversation, right? And what's more important, yeah. a number of, uh, of, of uh, citations? That's fine. You want to do that, knock yourself out. But the number of people who are on a stream, I would say, is equally, if not more important. Yeah. Public Maybe advocacy also, and motivation to pursue the, the career path as well. Yep. Maybe... And um, Professor XP, you could explain what an impact measure is. Oh, because I, God. it's yeah. one of these academic things that not any, there's nowhere else that kind of uses it. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. Okay. Impact it's, factor. It's painful. So this idea of impact factor of a journal is a score based on how it's evaluated and how significant people perceive it to be and part of that is based on how often it's how much it's read how many are libraries it's in and how often articles in it are cited and used right i mean some kind of mm -hmm. conglomeration of this i've never gotten to the actual the actual you know construction of it and if you take a journal like american sociological review it's like the top journal and american journal of sociology asr is the top journal in sociology i defy you to read it I mean, mm -hmm. it's like literally unreadable. <laughs> and you're like, well, you look at the title, blah, 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 colon. I mean, it has more colons than a proctologist's office. <laughs> da, 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 colon, <laughs> you know, something, something, yeah. something, something. And you're like, you're like, oh, this, this looks really interesting. And then you get like one page in or, or one paragraph in, you're going, what, 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 what happened? Why did you take the soul of this thing, rip it out of the body, throw it on the ground, stomp on it, lay it on fire, and then dance around it? because it's unrecognizable as a phenomenon that is mm -hmm. human produced. But that's, yep. that's, that's a highly ranked journal. Mm. Right. So everybody's trying to get their articles published in these journals, which have the big impact factors, right. which lead to their institutional advantages as they climb the ladder of academia. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's all tied up 
into the institutional culture very tidily. And the yeah, higher you go, the more they rely on that. So, like, there mm -hmm. are some places that if you don't publish a, a article once a year in ASR, nothing else matters. Like, hmm. that right. they want you in those top journals, which is silly, in my opinion. And this yeah. is where I got so lucky. And, you know, I know people on Twitch, especially like in these communities, they hear business school and they just kind of go, like, you know, ah, eh, business school sucks. I have had more freedom. <laughs> working at a business school to do whatever the hell it is I want to do. Cause they don't know what sociology is, nor do they care. Sure. Um, I can do like whatever I want. I can teach whatever I want, however I want. And then we were also told each department needs to construct its own impact evaluation, um, you know, scheme or, or approach for itself. So we got mm -hmm. to construct something for ourselves and we included applied work. And we included other things. Like I get credit for doing podcasts because I have my own podcast. I get credit for doing Twitch. I get credit for um, working and consulting with businesses or community groups. Most other institutions that are regular research one schools, it don't count unless it's in one of these top journals or you're getting a grant mm -hmm. funded for it. And that's fine. If that's what you want to do, God bless, good luck, have fun. But we need as a discipline and as a, you know, as a, as a profession – we need to expand out what we consider to be worthwhile activities to include things like this. Hmm. Yeah, th there's a lot in the circles that I run in, even I've run up against this where um, there's this opinion, um, this kind of, it, it kind of parallels what we've been talking about. This um, desire for somebody to invent a new term for something a yeah. kind of social process versus the kind of work that I like doing, which is this more, you know, that has a point, right. That, that, right. that, that someone out there in the world can pick up and go, that speaks to me. And that moves me to do something like, you know, get angry about why um, there's racism in the world and, and seek to change it. Yeah, I mean, coming up with a new name for old stuff is what we call consult consulting. Um, that's, great. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's, that's how we make money. It's like, you know, I have this old thing, but if I rebrand it, put my name on it, put a TM next to it, and put it on a website, I'm golden. And, it, and it, if you can have it come with like a really good um, graph or chart or like, you know, yeah. infographic, then, <laughs> oh, that's a book deal, truly. Okay. Like, this is how it happens. I used, well, so talking about sports uh, psychology, I, I used to work um, in the NBA in their internal consulting group. Oh, great. Um, yeah. So, you should and come I come talk I to my class sometime. There, I got my class. class. I'm, I'm, I'm teaching sociology of sports this semester. Oh, shit. Oh, sweet. oh wow. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. I'm a former uh, at the NBA. The, the name of the department's Teambo, which stands for Team Marketing Business Operations. And uh, yeah, we, we act as the in house business consultants to all uh, 30 NBA teams and then the teams in the G League and um, the WNBA. So nice. yeah, it was, but like with consulting, it's absolutely true. I mean, it is like, um, it, it's oftentimes our, our in market visits were dreaded because it's like, just tell it, like, we're there to be like, hey, here's where you're fucking up. And um, yeah, shocker, that's not always welcome. But also a lot of times we're just telling them what they already knew. So I, I noticed part of the reason I decided to leave um, was because I kind of wanted to avoid that whole like ivory tower perception of like that, that consulting can often come into, but not always. If you're a good consultant, you're good at um, avoiding that. But it was sort of that mindset of like, I don't want to be that person that just goes in and is like um, telling you the problems you already know and putting a different name on it. But this is where I think, and when I do try to do consulting work or speaking to businesses or whatever, I don't change who I am or what I say. I don't change my sociology. Mm -hmm. I apply the sociology I know and I know works to their situation. So, for instance, you talked about the find the problems. There's a whole area of community development called assets-based community development or ABCD. It was founded by Jody Kretzman and John McKnight. They're at Northwestern University now. And it was something I was trained in when I was working at United Way in Detroit. Anyway, one of the, what, the, what they talk about is rather than building com communities based on a needs assessment, which tries to identify 
the gaps or deficiencies in that community, maybe you might want to find out what people already have, what assets they have, what skills and competencies they have, and how we can mobilize and connect, connect those to build communities from the inside out, right? Totally. So one, one of the things that I do as a consultant is say, first thing we have to do is find your assets. Let's find the things that people are already good at that you don't appreciate, that you ignore, that become invisible because you're only counting them in this particular kind of way, which removes the humanity from the organization. So you're doing it wrong. And how do I know you're doing it wrong? because of all these things, but you have really special people. If you approach things, I don't use this word, from a more humanistic or, or humanist perspective, then we could actually build communities here that uh, that people are connected and where people are connected. So, you know, it's it's trying, to, and that's, now that's called employee experience, right? There's a new area of work called employee experience, which is trying to be employee-centric, focus on the needs of the employees for themselves, not for the organization itself. Uh, so it's like, how can we bring the values, right? The, the, the reasons why we got into these things in the first place into this broader audience and not lose ourselves in the process. And that's what I think about applied in clinical sociology as being. Um, I have a question. So when you're, when you're talking, cause these are like, I mean, I love just this discussion in general, but I feel like for so many companies, this is something that just continues to be deprioritized yeah. um, or seen as superfluous or a nice to have yeah. rather than like needing to be central to um, their business and how they operate their business. Um, in in the, the cases that you've, and I don't know if this is off topic guys, so sorry, but I'm just curious um, when you're consulting with these companies, like have you seen reception change over the last like five or so years? Cause I would guess with COVID this sort of thing has been put front and center with the great resignation or whatever they're, they're calling people leaving their jobs. Um, right. But have you seen attitudes evolve? I think the first question I always want to know is how serious are you about the things you're telling me you want to do? Mm -hmm. Is it lip service or do you, are you truly committed to this idea? So we want to improve DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and just, you know, belonging. Do you really? Well, where, where is it situated in the organization? Well, it's part of HR. Then you're probably not really serious about it. You're treating it as a regulation checkoff that you have to be in compliance with. How does it work into your strategy? Right? It doesn't. Well, then you're just kind of going through the, you know, going through the motions, so to speak. How do you evaluate impact and success? What, what are the metrics? What are the outcomes you're looking for? So you can pretty quickly start to diagnose how serious they are. And then there's enough examples out there today of companies doing it well and succeeding that you can point to and show. Because there's a reason why leadership is taught in MBA programs. It's because managers aren't leaders. People don't become successful managers by leading. They become successful managers by following. Sorry, it's just true. Yeah. Oh my you God. Know. Yes. No, like that, mm, that drives me crazy, especially when like not everyone, although not <laughs> everyone needs to be a manager and like manage people. Like there should be more tracks where you're able to progress through your career, whatever, because not everyone A, wants to manage people and B, is like well suited to doing that. Um, my, uh, my fiance is dealing with this right now. He's an engineer. <laughs> And shocker, uh, not all engineers who progress to the manager level are well suited to like actually manage people or have developed like the necessary emotional intelligence and uh, people skills to manage effectively. And right. I, I, I can't help. I'm just like, this is what happens when we um, deprioritize soft skills or like the quote unquote soft sciences in people's um, education, because it turns out like when you're getting to be a more senior level in whatever your career is, if you don't have those, those people skills, those skills to like be able to conceptualize how you organize or operate your team impacts those deliverables that you care so much right. about, like that it should be seen as, as paramount to progressing to the, the manager level, but it's, it's not. One of the one of the things I tell people fundamentally is if you call people managers, they will. And that might not be what you want them to do. Um, and, you know, the I, you know, are they facilitators? Are they supporters? I mean, I guess in sports, they'd be athletic supporters. 
That was oh a joke. God. I just oh, geez. I'm sorry. Oh, geez. Um, I've called myself an athletic supporter uh, before and I didn't get it. And I got it too late when people started laughing. And I'm just like, oh, <laughs> damn it. Gross. Grow uh, up. That's part of the, that's, that's, that's the value of entertainment you will get on my channel right there. That's about it. Buena buena. It's about it. I am going to save that joke and probably use it this semester. So. By all means, please do. And so, I, you know, how do we change the word that you're using? Mm. The second thing I really don't like, soft skills and hard skills, I think more in terms of different types. So communication skills, analytical skills, critical thinking skills, relational or people's skills, um, you know, maybe even... Uh, you know, computational skills, if you want to throw it there. I created a list at some point. We did it on stream once. I have it somewhere. But like different skill sets, almost like different intelligences, right? That you can have multiple intelligences rather than like a single singular IQ measure. So we can have multiple skills that aren't like in the hard and soft because I don't know what those things mean. But going into all of them become essential, more so in certain jobs than others. But knowing that so that range of skills, that that composite skill set, puts somebody into a better position to approach different kinds of roles. One thing I've been wondering, um, since you teach at a private school, is um, do you run into students who take your classes and are like, "What the heck's the point of this? Like, why am I learning about this? This is a waste of my time." Yeah, sure. First, first day of class, I asked them, why are you here? And it's, it's not a buena buena question. It's not an existential question. It's like, <laughs> no, literally, like, why are you here? And, you know, first reason, um, I needed the credits, the full requirement. Second reason, it fit into my schedule. Third reason, I heard you didn't suck. Fourth reason, um, you know, it sounded interesting, usually in that order. Right. And that's yeah. fine. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I get it. I was I, I was in that position, too. But then it's up to me to kind of hook them with the content and the approach. And, you know, I know that Gremlin talks about doing, um, you know, workplace democracy. Um, I do classroom democracy. Uh, so we do a co-construction of the syllabus the first day. Right. Wow. You know, where I'm like, okay, let's talk about what you want to learn, what, what you, what, what you get more, most excited learning about why you want to learn this material in the first place, what kind of, content do you best absorb you know and how you know what makes for a good class what makes for a horrible class and then we together construct a lot of the approach for the semester i wish you were my professor <laughs> yeah <that's laughs> i wish i took classes with this guy oh, like amazing. literally when I, when i went through my uh my first semester uh with sociology it, it was okay every week we're going to go through a chapter of the textbook you're going to answer yeah. three questions. You're going to respond to three students' questions. And we're going to talk about it. And it ended up just being me and one of my old co-workers diving into, like, Marxist theory every class. <laughs> and there might have been a reason for that, which was not the professor. It might have been the tyranny of the numeric, right? That there's so much emphasis on assurance of learning such that learning doesn't happen, but we are assured it doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. You know, because now we have to standardize all content and all delivery so that we can measure it. You know, again, going back to the reductionism, this experimental model, we have to measure it across <laughs> sections, across classes, across professors, so that everyone's teaching the same thing in the same way. And we can then measure across those sections, it, you know, content that becomes boring. And this is what we call learning. Mm. So the professor might have been on the hook as well. And OK, so why is the professor on the hook? Well, the professor is on the hook because the dean and the provost are, are, had, are spearheading this initiative. Well, why are they doing that? Well, because the accreditors, they want to see evidence that people are learning. Well, why do they want to see that? Because parents want to know that students are learning for their money. Well, why do they want to know that? So the employers, can, <laughs> so the whole, the whole system is kind of screwed up, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's classic bureaucracy. Nobody is to blame, but everybody is doing wrong. Right. You know, it's, it's nutty. And that's where, like, at my school, I, you know, I'm just like, because, again, they don't care what I do. I don't have a major, although we did create the first DEI major in the country um, that I'm happy to talk about. But, yeah, but, you know, I don't have a sociology major. It's just an elective. No one cares. I can do whatever I want. And it's like a sandbox for experimenting in pedagogy. That's incredible. 
yeah it's so much fun just the notion of of democratizing curriculum is or um syllabus whatever uh terminology you used earlier just the notion of that is uh to to me i think a, a great way of looking at how we would analyze what values we are putting on like you said you know the exchange of um oh, what would be the word um Sorry, I lost it, but just it, it seems very interesting to me. I just, I'm just going to put a link in chat that uh, I, I I blogged. A, this is before COVID happened, by the way, and then like March 2020, COVID happened. But I blogged um, this experiment. I was blogging about it at my consulting website, which needs redoing. But at least you can look at that, and you can give you a sense of how we approached it. I'm booked and I, I didn't create the idea. I, I got it from Kathy Davidson's book, The New Higher Education, I think it's called, or The New Education. And she was talking about it in that book. And I just like, that's a good idea. I want to do that. Mm. And just, just kind of copied it. Could you, uh, um, could you yeah, like maybe, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, and the good thing is students are invested because they own it. Right. It's theirs. So right. when you're approaching the class as the semester begins, you say like between each student, you kind of agree upon a, a structure of how like we're we're gonna start midterms to finals. It's it's it's, bene it's a benevolent dictatorship. Okay. Um, you know, I'm I'm in charge. <laughs> right. Right. It's you know, but at the same time, I am very willing. It's like the the famous basketball coach Bobby Knight said. Bobby Knight said. I'm very democratic about things I don't care about. Hmm. Yeah. You know, we, we, we are using this textbook. However, what other materials would you like to look at? Are there movies you want to watch? Are there topics you want to explore? Are there, you know, should we be look, following uh, Instagram feeds? You know, should we be following podcasts? Should we be looking, you know, what, what do you want to do so we can cover the topics that we need to cover through the semester? Ooh, the Instagram feed is an interesting one because I would suggest following Gary V. Oh, yes, God. right. Is that why you're wearing the hat? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I I'm on the my Gary Sigma set. You can start dropping f bombs here and there. Yeah, that's right. I'm gonna <laughs> blow out this pop filter. There you go. <laughs> you're having to take out my headphones before you do that. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, why not, right? Because my job as a professor, as a sociologist, <laughs> is to integrate content into concepts. Mm -hmm. And if I can't do that, I need to find another line of work. And so, yeah, I've read Gary Vee's, I've read some of his books. I know who he is. I can to I've totally talked about Gary Vee in class before, and I can totally take Gary Vee and spin him off in five different directions if I need to, relating to things around sports. You know, a business is competition. Boom, right there. Let's look at that. How is competition as a business ethos constructed in and through the talks of Gary V or Shark Tank versus other kinds of a collaborative um, approaches to sport and athleticism? All right. With, Perfect. I, I could I could easily spend a day on that. Perfect. I I know, like I actually, um, I was a panelist once at a Silicon Valley Comic Con, and we were talking about the uh, psychology of fandom. And I was there to discuss the uh, similarities in both the cultivation and, um, you know, I guess just uh, behaviors of sports fandom and how there are overlaps, um, not only in fandoms for things that you would see at Comic-Con, um, but there's also, I use a, a lot of a degree of that in just like cultivating fandoms for products when I worked in brand marketing, yeah. um, because turns out they, as groups operate quite similarly. So you see a lot of parallels. So there are best practices that can be shared across industries, across, um, types of whether it's, you know, you're a fan of like a superhero or, um, a team or sport even like the way you you hook people get them engaged is is eerily similar that's and a lot of that's because it, it deals with like group dynamics it deals with like the different mentalities that you see um start to prosper and grow among these like like-minded groups of people and yeah you you have a lot of similar insights and takeaways that's interesting that uh, i've never heard of fandom within branding or at least put it like in that uh, context because when we look at something like, you know, we have a direct line sports, we have like 
I don't know, I, I don't know sports like uh, LSU fans. Everything is purple and gold, and you know they go out into the field and they cosplay as their as their uh, mascot. And mm -hmm. anime fans have their own fandom, and you know and when you go to a convention, everybody is Inuyasha. And mm -hmm. Tesla fans cosplay as millionaires. <laughs> right. or people that yeah are buying nfts but that's another yeah. um yeah but they're, they cosplay as entrepreneurs but entrepreneurs. Um, yeah i i like to joke it makes um my my uh fiance's family's from minnesota and so as you can imagine they are die hard vikings fans everyone there are die hard vikings fans and they get mad when um they wear their jersey and i say oh you're cosplaying <laughs> um they don't love that apparently yeah. it's very we different Madeline. Well, when they use the we pronoun, it's often good. Like, I didn't see you on the field. What position were you playing? Right, right. No, there... it's it's bizarre. But like, I use it. Sorry, one more, just to like make yeah, it related back to marketing. Like, a lot of it's because I mean, that's like the the ideal for marketers to be able to drive that kind of brand loyalties to the point where people shape a lot of like their personal identity around being that much of a fan of this. I mean, brands you see this with frequently are Apple. You know, people that are like obsessed with Apple products. And so it becomes like part of they want to just not only like buy all those products, but they really want to display like that they are an Apple person. Tesla, you right. see that. Yeah. Course, the commodity but... fetishization is like integrally tied to the identity. Oh, yeah. So you, you see it quite frequently. And, and there's a lot of times, you know, I think it's a mistake um, when they don't look to things like anime or um even like video games where they have these just like diehard followings, um, like those those best practices are applied elsewhere, but you have to like do it organically. Otherwise, we've also seen like brands do that where it's not good. What I'm and hearing is tell. we need fandom in academia. Hell yeah. I was just about to ask that question. How do, how do we <gasps> pump up the uh, public scholarship fandom? How do we, you know, get people following us like they do with some of their other favorite sources of random bullshit on the internet? Pogos. Hot tub streams in the library. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I actually like really quick I, on this point about, and I want to get to that question. I think it's a great one. I drive in the more shameless self-promotion. On my podcast, Experience by Design, we had a gentleman, Dr. Michael Solomon, who wrote a new book called The New Chameleons. And he looks at um, how to connect with consumers who divide categorization, that we don't have one identity, we have different identities. And people buy based on their identities. And so he, he has a degree in social psychology from Brandeis. And so how do we apply that understanding of people's identities belonging to groups to marketing and their purchasing decisions? And so it's exactly everything y'all were just talking about around sports. And we, in that episode, we dig into that in a lot of detail. And the book is actually a, a pretty good one exploring that. Um, and it's, I love the question about how do we get become get people to become fans of uh, of, of public academics? And I, I clearly don't know because I only have like 400 followers, so don't ask me. <laughs> um, I, th I think I think you know for for the, for I'm going to invoke Buena Buena in this for you younger people. Right. When Buena <laughs> and I talk about this, we're like, you know, we're, we're, I think that the future is 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 there in what you all are doing. I mean, I'm just we're just kind of hanging in it, trying it out. But I tell them the, all the time. <laughs> yeah. The engagement that you all are creating in, in doing this stuff is, I think, where where that needs to be. And on the academic side, and this is something I'm pushing for at my school, recognizing this as a viable outlet for knowledge for scholarship, right? Mm -hmm. It's not an either or, it's a yes and. Yes, you can publish and you might be expected to publish something. And yes, you should get credit for podcasts. You should get credit for blogs. You should get credit for live streaming. I don't care if you get credit for TikTok. There's that one woman who is, I forgot her name, but I follow <laughs> her on, twi on Twitter where she always debunks the bad science around COVID. Like she'll play the video and then she'll talk against it and be like yeah that's not true <laughs> oh yeah I've seen that. that. there have been a few of that one one platform that does that really well where you're starting to see more um i don't know like some of its academics but also just like scientists doctors do that um is TikTok because mm -hmm. they'll yeah. film these like quick little things where yeah they do exactly what you're doing where it's almost like a reaction video but they're going through as you hear the person just like point by point they dissect it and go like no actually here's what the real the reality is so I think like if if 
if more academics or um, you know folks even that are like academic adjacent leveraged social media or these sort of like quick hit pieces of content um, that could be I don't know like a, a ramp up to popularizing or like fandoms. I think so. And the problem that I have and like Winnebuen has, we have, is that we weren't raised in this ecosystem, so we had to learn it. Whereas like mm -hmm. my 12-year-old daughter, my 16-year-old daughter um, has to learn it. I mean, I see Professor Key raising his hand. You I, I, you had to learn it that too? That was a affirmative. Yeah. Like same. I, yeah. you know, this is all kind of new in some ways. Some of it's familiar because this feels like a rebirth of the pre-internet, like the early days where it was a right. bunch of nerds hanging out, having fun, dialing BBS boards. Yeah, um, totally. And but my 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 twelve year old daughter was like, here, here, look at the TikTok video me and my friends made in the bathroom during school. I'm like, that's <laughs> great, I guess. But it, you know, it's their attempt at creating content to connect with people. It's a broader audience. That's what writing a research paper should be. Right? Mm -hmm. It should be an attempt to communicate and connect with a broader audience. And so, and, and you know who else has talked about this? Gary V. Talked about mm -hmm. content creation, right? And younger people learning those skills that they're just adapting naturally because they, they're, they're enmeshed in it. And so rather than telling kids, you know, stay off your phones, don't use it to create video, that might be a pathway if directed properly where they can actually get that skill. So when I tell my students, they have to, I don't tell them they have to do, they have to do research papers. I tell them you have to produce um, output. Mm. Well, you tell me what it is you want to create. Mm. So like a creative research project. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, why am I making them do, and I, it took me a while to come to this realization. Like, why am I having them write research papers? They're not going to become researchers. Right. And they find it boring. They don't get excited about it. There's no passion in it. But if they're like, oh, and I had a student one time do this. It was a paper uh, assignment around police interrogation for a criminal justice class. He recorded a dramatized version of a police interrogation with his roommate. Oh, that's cool. And he nice. turned that in. I was like, Psh. did you learn wow. something? Yep. Did you have fun? Yep. Did your roommate learn, learn something? Yep. Good enough for me. Yeah. Why not? I, I kind of did that, but yep. it wasn't prompted when I took my... Um, <laughs> When I took my uh, game theory final, um, I blanked on the final question, but I knew the professor was, or like the adjunct professor wasn't coming back the next year. He got a different job. So I wrote as my answer, I'm like, hey, listen, I don't know the answer to this, but here's why I'm going to think that it's going to be okay. Like, let's make a deal. Cause here's what I do know. And I'm going to like bank on this. So like, let's do it. And so I made it into this whole like game theory thing about why I should like, ans not answer the question and should answer something completely different. And I got credit <laughs> for it. Apparently he really liked it. I mean, if your so, rhetoric's good enough, go for it. That's what I was banking on. I was like, all right, like sound smart, be charming, make it like kind of relevant. Um, cause I did learn a lot. I just like blanked on that question and like, yeah, if it's a good professor, they recognize when there's still value in that where it's like, okay, if I'm like here to evaluate whether or not you, I, I can like feel comfortable giving you an A in the class or B in the class, whatever, because you've grasped the, the subject matter with enough of a, like an expertise or knowledge, like then I, I don't, I don't know. I, I've also like failed the test because the professor had half of it be true and false questions and like everyone had no idea like english wasn't his first language and so they were just worded in a way where we were all like right what and so yeah, yeah. that was fun <laughs> i mean I, like i uh, love this i love your approach that like honestly i'm surprised you don't get more students saying that's why they took your class because you have this yeah, like they do but you know i mean i get it it's you know it's and i got i came to this rather late i've been i've been a professor at my school for 22 years i taught my first college class in 1993. it's taken me a while to get enlightened right so i, I was doing things in a replicative way for a really long time because that's just it's like you don't notice what you are doing like i tell my students when i teach ethnography not my dogs are just going crazy I don't know what's going on. You need to check on him. I don't think so. It sounds like there's a dog fighting ring. It's like living back in Detroit. 
<laughs> and the funny thing is, right? The funny thing is, one of the dogs is really small. Another dog is 95 pounds. Oh, God. Mm -hmm. I'm the small I, one's I'm, in charge, right? I'm oh, I know on which one's in one. charge. <laughs> I'm betting on the little one because yeah. that little one, he actually was a rescue, and mm -hmm. uh, Tropical knows this. He was a rescue from Puerto Rico, and oh. uh, he's yeah, he's spicy. <clears throat> he doesn't take anything. He's just like you Those know what? Those little dogs, those they're yeah. in charge. You see, like a, a group of like two or more dogs, and they're all big, but one of them small. That small one is the one in charge. <laughs> absolutely yeah he's the one in charge and they were going crazy in there and i have no doubt that that the big one now is cowering somewhere but what i was, what I was going to say about like students taking the class i think most professors or at least i do want the number one things i want my students to have is a thought an original thought can you have an original yes. thought? <laughs> please please just I mean, give don't me tell that. me what i told you just can you have an original thought can you show me your thinking and that's, you know, if they can show me that, that's great. And if they, they can't, I fail. They fear about it, though. They are so f afraid to do that. I mean, mm -hmm. I once gave my class a project where it was intentionally just very vague. It's like, be as creative as you possibly can be. And they were, they begged for half the semester, please tell us what to do. Please tell us, tell us what to do. We need these, put it down in steps one, two, three. We need to, you know, yeah. and they, they resisted it for half of the semester. It's just I mean, incredible. It's also, I think when you think about the way, like not in higher education, but just K through 12 for a lot of us, like I went through public school, like that, unfortunately, like having to just meet those, those standards and like do that, that was, that's how we were evaluated the entire time. I think there are some schools maybe that are better at, at getting their students to think differently because they grade a little bit differently, but those are often like, you know, these like private schools that aren't always um, accessible to, to everyone across like different socioeconomic uh, conditions. But like, I know for me, at least in college, it was an adjustment to um, have I mean, I loved it. I loved having classes like that where you're asked to be a little more creative and think outside the box where you don't just have these like, you know, the criteria that you need to check off and then have mm -hmm. it be done. It, it was like retraining your entire brain because <sighs> your entire life, that was, was yeah. how you were evaluated. So it, yep. it can be scary. To kind yeah, of uh, jump absolutely. off to what Maddie is saying, too, and that now that I've had time to kind of accumulate my thoughts on this after brain farting earlier, I think what draws me to this the most is kind of, I mean, um, Professor EXP, you mentioned that, you know, I talk about, like, workplace democracy. In a way, it does something that the workplace democracy does as well, which is gives more agency to the students mm -hmm. to have that original thought. It frees them up to be more creative and actually engage with the material instead of just it being... All right, here's we're going to go through these steps and instead it's okay, we're going to learn what this is we're actually engaging with. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just looking at the in the chat that Kiel's KK says about, you know, teaches ninth grade or they teach ninth grade and we're all forced into such a box. Yeah, I mean, teaching K through 12 is so much harder than my job. So first off, props to you for teaching ninth grade. I can I have a I have a ninth grader, I have a 11th grader, I have a 6th grader. And I can't imagine dealing with that age group. It just, Especially uh, in this political environment. Oh, my God. It's amazing. <laughs> um, you know, there's, I have this really good book here that I haven't read yet, but I've been meaning to. Uh, it's only been three years since I bought it. I'm sure I'll get around <laughs> to it. But it's called Creating Innovators, The Making of Young People Who Will Change the World uh, by Tony Wagner. And I read it a little bit. But, it, you know, it gets into this idea that how do we – create an education in which people can be innovative. They can be creative, mm -hmm. you know, and we, that gets back to arts education. It gets back to music education. It gets back to, you know, the death, the, the, the deficit, you know, this overemphasis on STEM. And I'm, I'm sorry for anybody who is in STEM, no offense, but the overemphasis on STEM as the panacea for economic growth. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I so I am at the intersection because I was a double major. Um, I double majored in economics and theater uh, with a minor in math. So I was all over the place. But um, 
it it drove me crazy. It still drives me crazy to this day because I work with a lot of people who um, come from either they had their like both feet in one category versus the others, or they sort of over indexed their their coursework in one versus the other. And I mean, you can be the most brilliant engineer, the most brilliant mathematician, scientist, but if you cannot communicate yeah. why what you're doing is important and why people who aren't don't just have your academic background should care, then like it's it's useless. And and I feel like those it, people love things, and this is why people are so rigid with like their having courses be where you're ticking off boxes because quantitative things are so much easier to evaluate, like um, see the value of, whereas things like communication skills, it's harder to assign like a quantitative metric to measure that like success against. I, and I noticed this when I was like consulting with businesses too, where it's like, well, how, how is your, um, uh, like your internal communication program, like how do you communicate large um, organizational changes? Like what's your process for ensuring that everyone's on the same page about these things? They're kind of like, oh, uh, we have like our intranet and we just like do the post thing there and we send emails without recognizing that like maybe people deal with that information differently or the the manner in which they communicate that is going to significantly impact whether or not that transition is successful or that change in strategy is successful right. it's because people just deprioritize it again because i think like it's it's harder to assign like a, a or categorize like give it a hard value to measure success against or to see why something like learning to write or critically think is going to lead to a better rate of success or, you know, better job prospects than something where it's like, oh, well, I have, I know how to code in this language and this language, thus I can have this job. It's just harder to, to quantify. I would say and this was a Buena Buen side of the street that we've convinced ourselves of the concreteness of the quantitative, not that it is concrete, but we've convinced ourselves that it is concrete. And I'll give you right. an example from research I did. So it was, um, I did a lot of research in medical transcription, you know, the, the largely women, not large women, but largely women, uh, who take what doctors say and turn them into medical records, records. Okay. Medical transcriptionists started to get, you know, it's like, well, how are we going to pay them? And it's almost like the mill work, right? We're going to pay them by piece mm -hmm. rate. So we're going to pay them by line, but what's a line? What's a line? <laughs> how do you measure how many lines there are? If somebody yep. writes two words and hits return, should they get paid for the entire line? Should that be counted as a full line? How do we know it's what's a full line versus mm -hmm. a half line versus uh, you know not a complete line? Because then they're like, well, if it's they're just going to increase their spacing or you know, those spaces or decrease their margins, right. or then they're, they're trying to game the system. Yeah, exactly. So we're going to do we're going to go to to VBC, visible black characters. We're only going to pay you based on visible. We're going to count how many visible black characters there are. Um, have you ever tried to read a document without the non-black characters, the spaces? <laughs> Those end up being kind of important too. So, so then it so then it devolved into well, how do we count what's a VBC? Is a heading count the same way? You know, it, what if you're using you know this or that? It got it, it fell apart because what they assumed was concrete. It's countable how many black characters there are in the actual production of the work. That yeah. fell away because there were other factors that had to be considered. I taught a class that I created called Data, Context, and Information. And the premise is data plus context equals information. Data without context mm -hmm. means nothing. It literally means nothing. You need to yep. add context. And here goes to diversity, right? Different people who are looking at that same data differently are going to come out with different information. There's some great work around data feminism happening that is – really exemplifying a point that I've been talking, not me, but ethnomethodology, the kind of sociology I do, has been talking about for a long time. Numbers are indexical. They achieve meaning in context. Mm -hmm. Everything is indexical. And so we think they're concrete, but they're only these numbers are only concrete because we've convinced ourselves there is concreteness to them. Right. Whoa, we dude. have this objectivist. <laughs> I know, right? 
get a spliff on yes. that. Yes. Oh. <laughs> No, like but when you tell people that oh their heads gosh. explode and they don't like you because then it, it complicates their world. We what do you mean? Numbers world. aren't real? Yeah, they're <laughs> not you real. saying numbers aren't real? Ask Wittgenstein. Um, you know, <laughs> and, and so you kind of get into how do we construct what, what might be real then? We need a multi-methodological approach which incorporates different kinds of dimensions to get a more holistic understanding of whatever phenomena we're trying to approach. No, we just need to put it into an assembly line and it'll be fine. And it might be, but it's not going to be great. <laughs> hey, right? we'll make money off it anyway. So And they will. No, no work. No work. But, it, but in the Gary V hyper competitive economy, do you want to be fine or do you want to be great? Right. And this, this is where I turn business back on. Them. I'm like, you tell me. <laughs> You say you want to be leaders. You say you want to be differentiators. You say, you know, the strongest, you know, it's the Herbert Spencer survivor of the fittest or the strongest survive. Do you want to be fine? Is that your competitive strategy, being fine or is it being great? I can tell you how to be fine. You're probably already good at being fine. Do you know how to be great? If you don't, here's how we can get there. Wow. I feel uh, like I've just, had, I feel like, like I've had, like there's yeah. a, I feel like I've seen that on a poster where it's like, are you okay being fine or do you want to be great? And I'm always just like, I want to be great. But you're around then, these business. I'm around these business people for 22 years. I've, I've watched them. I've studied mm -hmm. their ways. Like they were a yeah. tribe. <laughs> I know their customs. I know how they behave. You're a business. Exactly. You're like a business anthropologist. You're I like, I've a lived among it's, them. That's exactly <laughs> right. You know, you're like, okay, I, I, read, I read Gary Vee. I've read these books. I've read books on entrepreneurship. I've studied entrepreneurship. I understand this stuff. And so then you understand it. So then you can flip it and put it back on them in terms that resonates with what you understand to be important and real based on your professional uh, training. And that becomes fun. And now then, then they're like, I want to be great. Okay, well, how do you, you know... There's a great line in the movie, and if you watch my stream, this is how my, my streams are always tangents. They're all over the place because my brain is like a bunch of bingo balls knocking against each other. There's this great line in Lawrence of Arabia, obviously. So we've gone from Gary Vee to Lawrence of Arabia, where Peter O'Toole is talking to one of the, um, the tribal leaders about, he's saying how great Islam was, you know, how great Islamic civilization was. And Peter O'Toole says, time to be great again, my lord. Do you want to be great? Or do you want to be average? You don't need me to be average. You can always do or do that on yourself. If, if you, what's that one book? Dare, it's uh, Brene Brown. Dare to be great. She wrote a book on. Mm. Love her. So you Love know. Her. So that, that's, I mean, that, I just that's what I do. Yeah. No, it's true. Well, and I think the reason sometimes, at least what I've noticed, people that have like become complacent in their jobs or they're just like, I don't care about being great. I just want to be average. More than often than not, I find it's because they've been like beaten down by the like mm -hmm. existing in a capitalist system because like I think naturally, no, people want to have like meaning. They want to have significance. Mm -hmm. But like when you exist with all these um, forces that are outside of your control that just make your life like infinitely harder and, and have less meaning, then yeah, some people lose that desire desire because they're like, I'm just trying to get by. I'm just trying to feed my family and pay the mortgage, whatever. However, if you're a business leader and you have, you know, that uh, hefty bonus structure and other things, it's like, no, you, you have a little bit of uh, emotional wiggle room to like want more and you should. And if you don't, then like, don't be in a leadership position because like well, leaders supposed to like move things. Forward. There's a great book. Oh, it's this one. Um, this is a really, it's a small book. It's called Zone to Win. It's a really nice book because what he talks about is that um, businesses will devote most of their resources to current lines of business that they know are profitable, which results in them not innovating into a better competitive space in which they become viable in the future, which is just what, just what you described, right? It's exactly the same thing. And so how do you then construct a, an environment in which you can devote, you know, maybe 80% of your work to 20%, you know, of, of, of your, of the potential line you have of the potential development you have, because that's where, that's where your money is made, but you need to have that other space. And that's where passion comes in. And that's where creativity comes in. And that's where connection comes in. And that's where sociology comes in. 
And that's where psychology comes in. And this is why we have organizations who create like skunk work operations that are off the books, kinds of projects that, that aren't beholden to any operational line of business, but allows them to have that freedom to move and to create. And that becomes a, a very much a social psychological thing to establish those that cultural space to not only succeed, but to embrace failure as well. Totally. That goes back to something I think um, Homo Zygote and I talked about, about how real change, like try, so trying to fix this kind of broken system in academia, real change is going to have to come from without in some ways. Like it, institutionally, it's, it's not going to happen because of all these metrics and things we have to measure. But um, yeah, I just, I, I kind of look for ways in which we can kind of turn the system against itself in order to, yeah. to, to do this kind of stuff. Totally. And that's where I like on my stream, when we talk about capitalism, I all often say like, which one? Um, <laughs> so we talk about like B corporations, True. right? Like B corps are employee owned businesses. So Rutgers has a, um, both UMass Boston has a good operation around employee owned businesses. And so does Rutgers. There's actually a conference at Rutgers on just on employee owned businesses, looking at academic research to demonstrate the value proposition of employee owned business. And I'm happy to, I don't have it right in front of me right now. I'm happy to I'm share I was just going to say, please, please share that. I would be. I'll look it up right now. That. So, you know, you do have these, these opportunities and these, and, and the idea like the lionization of people like, you know, Jack Welch, which is just nonsense. Yeah. Right. In terms of like a, a sustainable model of business development in terms of creating a good corporate culture, you know, the, the slash and burn eighties, which some of us lived through, you know, are not the way forward and companies that are doing better are understanding that more. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but it's hard, but it's hard to get them to know that it's hard to get them to adopt it because, you know, change can be hard, especially when your job's on the line. And that's why having those, those success cases already there makes that transition easier because they aren't putting themselves out there alone, right? Being a leader doesn't mean being the first one in the parade. Yes. That's not leadership. That's just being in front. You know, being a leader means going off in a different direction. That's Almost fair. Yeah. On that note, like how, I mean, back to what uh, Professor Hughes said, you know, I think we've pretty well described sort of the the sustainable framework that you know, academia as a whole needs to take, right? Sort of uh, differentiating ourselves away from STEM and more towards a, a more collective, holistic uh, approach to education, right? We talked about you know, democratizing the classroom. We talked about all the different applications that sociology really should and could have in uh, educational upbringing, in academia, and just in general society. But, you know, I think where the conversation always runs into a roadblock is, okay, like we've identified this, what is, this is what needs to happen. What comes after that? Like, do we just advocate for it in hopes that and hope things come to be like, do we do this through more of a, almost a forceful approach with like academic unionization? You know, how, how do we go about actually implementing all of these really salient and insightful uh, points about how we better need to integrate sociology into a lot of what goes on in academia? I think it's all of the above, right? I think, you know, when I, I think it's funny, my daughter, who's a junior in high school, she can take sociology in high school, which was kind of mind blowing to me. That's awesome. I really want her to do it because I'm like, I got to know what they're teaching. Hmm. You know, I, I took I it in high school as well. Um, did you? I never really? had the chance. I took psychology, but I never had the chance. I was told that psych, uh, sociology was boring, but psychology, you could talk about psychopaths, and that's why I took it in high school. You have sociopaths. It's psycho psychopaths <laughs> on scale. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I wish my, I mean, I went to like a, a really high ranking, like a uh, public school here and we didn't have those classes. I took like Calc BC, which was great because you took it with physics AP. So, cause it was another AP classes. It was a dual and it was great because it was broken out into uh, what was it like mechanical, like, and um, electric in terms of like, or like for the, the Calc section and like the, the uh, one side made, like basically electric was damn near impossible. Um, so you had no idea what you were doing, but man, I would have taken sociology. I would have taken psychology. That would have been great. I was just uh, taking like, oh, bio AP, which no, no offense. Biology is great. Homozygote. I appreciate <laughs> biologists. 
I want to. I wanted to ask um, homozygote, like, how do these issues play out in molecular biology? Um, yeah, is it the good. same? And and then also, I want to give you props because you know a lot of stuff. You've read a lot of stuff that I don't. I, that just amazes me when we converse about that. That I wouldn't expect someone in molecular biology to necessarily have read. Yeah, well, man, I feel like I've read a lot of that stuff. I, this goes back to what we've been saying all night. You know, it feels very deficient, sort of in the the STEM realm, right? Where, as Neuro Fourier said last week, you know, we're we're, we're taught how to be lab rats. So that's basically the you know culmination, the the magnum opus of what our education built up to is to you know how to know and master every technique and do all of the experiments the right way and like mm -hmm. you know know how to code and like use a computer to do stuff. But it goes back to what Professor Exp said earlier, right? That's just data. We don't have context. Like we are never taught how to put these things in context in the greater research questions we're asking and how this impacts the taxpayer that funds our research. And I, I think it really manifests you know with situations like COVID, right? We have a bunch of 5,000 IQ galaxy brain scientists that could, you know, analyze a viral phylogeny and, you know, give you five hypotheses about the origin of the latest variant. But, you know, what does that mean for the average person? What does that mean for somebody who, you know, is living with an immunocompromised family member or whatnot? Like, I feel like STEM's priorities are so out of whack because we just have this sort of intra-institutional culture of just hyper-focusing on the actual data, the actual science, and not really applying any context, not trying to make it more meaningful. And that's why I really appreciate uh, sort of that notion of trying to democratize the classroom because you're starting from a point of what's meaningful in context, right. what's meaningful to the students. And we just don't really get that. And I think that's really what almost translates into the higher up, you know, university administration and even higher up, you know, hyper focus on uh, citation metrics, on H index, right? How we've structured the system based around being the best lab rat generating the most right. exciting work, which then gives you the best, uh, you know, chance to pull in money to the university. And that's what incentivizes everybody. Like, that's kind of what, you know, gets me worked up about it. Like, I want to break that mentality. And I feel like STEM being such a driver, right, that change needs to come from within STEM, because other people in STEM are just, again, so hyper focused in the lab that they don't think outside of it. I think one of the things we're, we're, I've, I've been delving into, and this is going to sound pretentious, but it's really not like complexity theory. But not because I'm smart, because I'm not, but because complexity theory focuses on wicked problems that no one discipline can tackle on its own. And so if you think about, you know, traditionally it was like poverty, homelessness, whatever, um, that, you know, epidemics, right? You know, no one discipline can tackle, an ep you know, dealing with an epidemic on its own, right? Clearly. And we're seeing this, right? So it takes everybody to contribute, not just in their silos, but also across. One of the things I love about Twitch is um, that this is the most interdisciplinary communication I've ever had in my career. And I've been in a mm -hmm. good situation for it. I've published more outside of sociology than in it. And I've collaborated with a lot of people in business and other kinds of disciplines. But you will rarely, on a college campus, see professors from different departments engaging to this level for this length of time around these kinds of topics <laughs> ever, but Twitch you do, I mean, which makes it magical. Yeah. I think one thing I would I, maybe that I'd like to see more of, and I think some programs are starting to embody this. I know my brother just finished his grad program um, across the Bay. I'm in San Francisco. He finished at Berkeley and he did it um, in it was what the school of information, but it was for like data right. science. But right. a lot of the classes he took were in their business school. Right. And there was a decent amount of crossover yep. um, that you could see. And I think um, the more programs that we see, especially programs that maybe would more traditionally be geared towards just STEM, the more we could see crossover with classes, maybe from other um, departments from the school that, that, that contribute to that degree at least that would maybe reinforce the um, cross-disciplinary nature yeah. of like what this work looks like when applied. And also like how maybe it could look like in academia where it it's, th these don't operate in silos. Right. Um, that's, that's one thing, but again, that's, that's something where you have to have buy-in across the, the academic spectrum to, like enforce that and enable that to happen. And I think, you know, maybe, and it, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not in academia, but maybe there for some of the more old school folks, there's 
there's likely to be resistance to that because they see it not not as broadening and and expanding like the students idea of like how this is applied but they may see it falsely as watering down uh, there's a lot there i schools are great information schools are great because they tend to be interdisciplinary um, I'm in an inter interdisciplinary department. I'm in a sociology department. I'm in a different business department, which is interdisciplinary around mm -hmm. experience design. Academic, the, the the academic leaders are like those big schools, right? That tend to kind of set, I, I say leaders in quotes, because they tend to set the trajectory of where academia goes. Those mm -hmm. schools get ranked higher the more they replicate themselves. What do I mean by that? The more graduate students they pump out that look like them, that get academic jobs, that publish in academic journals, that get placed in other similar programs, right? Then et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the whole premise of the enterprise is not learning per se, it's professional replication at the big schools. That's why if you wanna look for the best examples of, of learning, I would say, and I might not be popular for saying this, I, that would be the first time, I would look at the mid-tier and smaller schools mm. because they tend to have more freedom and they're more engaged in people's lives, right? Than, mm. um, than, than, than the bigger name schools. I say bigger name, it could be a small private liberal arts school that's still got a big name attached to it, right? Like that's what I'm talking about. Um, so, you know, I mean, those, and those schools are fine and that's fine. I'm not saying don't do that, but I'm saying don't pretend that that's all there is. That's all. That's yeah, a good point. Uh, is this consistent in your experience too? Like, you know, I think you've been in academia for a fair amount of time uh, to some extent, right? It, are sort of smaller schools more intellectually free? Ooh. Is he frozen? I think he froze. We froze. I will say at my, at the tiny little liberal arts school where I went, they encouraged this because you could uh, design your own major. And as long as you got sign off from your uh, advisor and they like were like, yeah, that sounds fine. But I mean, I knew people that created some like bonkers sounding majors, but they were grounded in like this cross disciplinary thing. And um, some of it involved like a degree of um, independent study where they like actually put together a like research project or something and then drew from a number of different disciplines and departments to like see it through and i always thought that was really neat and like i don't know that's always how i envisioned like true academia being was like having like using your knowledge of certain functional areas and then like being the conduit because you like are able to because you've achieved that level of like mastery of certain areas that you're able to then like extend over and, and see the applications elsewhere. But I, I think because we were a small liberal arts school, that's why people were able to do that. Because just like you had outlined, um, we weren't we weren't dealing with the, the same forces that you would get at like a big name um, school that's a feeder for a lot of those uh, you know, researchers and I don't know. Yeah. And I would say being a private school and I, oh, you know, wins back, but I know professor Q talks about this. I'm at a private school. He's at a public school. He, he, his, his school is governed by, um, you know, the developing country that is known as Missouri. Um, oh, misery. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, and so it's the state has a role in that where at my school, you know, we we don't have that worry. About, I mean, obviously there's some regulations, but we don't have to worry about that state level interference in what it is that we do. Even, uh, did you ask me a question, Marcus? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think we were kind of just touching I'm on sorry. You know, the. Sorry, I lost my territory. audio for a second there. Oh no, yeah, I figured I saw your uh, head on your headphones, so I figured it was uh, audio difficulties. But uh, no, I think what we're kind of talking about is sort of like the landscape uh, in academia at sort of specific schools, you know, public versus private or, you know, size based in terms of you know, how much intellectual freedom they may or may not have to, you know, modify their curricula in such a fashion that it might be more uh, interdisciplinary or, you know, integrative with other uh, you know, subjects in you know, specific sectors. You know, what, what's your sort of perspective on, on that based on where you've been? Right. Well, um, there's a couple different things. I mean, my own personal experience 
right? So I've went, I've gone to three different schools. I've gone to Northwestern, which is a private school, about a 7,500 undergrad, uh, very prestigious. Um, the one thing that they did absolutely right was that they made every freshman take two quarters. We worked on the quarter system, not the semester system, two quarters of um, freshman composition, even the engineers, the engineering school, the communication school, the liberal arts school. Um, let's see what, I'm not sure if there was another school, but all of, this, all of the schools within the university, every single freshman had to take two quarters of freshman composition that facilitated their communication that Maddie was, so t was talking about earlier. Um, and I've even had people years later say that, you know, even the engineers at Northwestern could write better than some, you know, of their colleagues who graduated from liberal arts colleges. So that's one thing. Then I went to a, a small teaching college for a master's degree. Um, it was kind of an interdisciplinary professional degree. And there was a lot of collaboration um, among the small faculty. Um, and it was dedicated mostly to teaching. It had been set up as a teaching college in 1909. And then I did a PhD at a big state school, you know, a 40,000 student Penn State campus in the middle of Pennsylvania um, at a new college that was established to be interdisciplinary. And even, even in my college, there's still, I mean, there was a lot of interdisciplinary scholarship, but there wasn't a whole lot of cooperation among the different kind of what started to become silos you know, the, the computer science folks, the computer science focused, and then the HCI and the user interface focused, and then the sociological and informatics type mm -hmm. focus. Um, and even when I tried to take courses outside of my college, you know, as a graduate student, um, I wasn't allowed to because there was institutional barriers. You know, the, the college in, um, of liberal arts didn't want to allow graduate students from, you know, information sciences to be, you know, part of their classroom. And, you know, that kind of pissed me off a little bit. <laughs> but there's, there's this thing that happens is that there's some interdisciplinary stuff, but that's so, it's not culturally fostered. It's so right. dependent on the individual researcher that sometimes they get lucky in their networks and other times they don't. And sometimes they're geared towards that type of thing and sometimes they aren't. So it's very sporadic. And I wish there was much more of it. I wish there was, you know, much more value put on the interdisciplinary um, scholarship that goes on. And, you know, I'm kind of, I, see myself as kind of interdisciplinary. Um, but it gets really hard because, you know, you're not, as an interdisciplinary scientist, you have to have a broader range of things and understanding of things, but you can't have the depth that somebody right. within a particular domain has. And that's what university departments who do their own hiring are looking for. So yep. it, you have to get lucky in terms of an administrator who, or a chair or, you know, dean of a school who wants to foster some of that. And again, that's not institutionally pushed. It's all individually based. Can I tell you a quick story about how silly that gets? Um, this is, this is oh, really sad and funny. <laughs> so at my, I was a department chair for 10 years, which is a horrifying experience. Um, but <laughs> there it was. I was in a department chair meeting of all department chairs, which was, you know, tw twice a month event. And people are like, you know what, we really need students to integrate their knowledge more. We really need them to be able to kind of integrate with their <laughs> learning more. We need to have, have them pull it all together. I said, um, that's great. Then why do you penalize them if they use material from other classes in their assignments? Mm -hmm. 
Damn. And I said, you know, what? Like, you just well, called I, me out. <laughs> <laughs> Students will, <laughs> professors will say something like, you can't self plagiarize. I'm like, I don't know what that means, self plagiarism. Like, you know, you, you can't use work from another class in another assignment. I'm like, but we do that all the time when we write our papers. We, we refer mm -hmm. to other things we wrote when we publish our papers. So it's yeah. called working smarter. Yeah. So yeah. Why don't you, why don't you make it a requirement that students must draw from other classes in their assignments to show how they can integrate knowledge and just do the proper citation of their work. And that people just looked at me like I created fire. I'm like, we, we literally <laughs> penalize, we literally penalize them for doing the thing mm -hmm. that you're saying you want to encourage them to do. Can someone right. break that down for me, how that makes any sense whatsoever? Because I'm I, missing. The like... whipping will improve until morale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the we'll we'll continue continue to morale yeah. No, but like, I also yeah. it'd be like, okay, it, that's fair. But how about this? Then you are only allowed to teach like course material. You can't like cross teach things. So like, no, everything that you only teach in this specific class, you can you can't teach in any of the other ones. If it's called, nope, you ha it has to be just this one. It's like, no, do you see why that's ridiculous? Like it's now, why would it be ridiculous to hold your students to a different standard? Also, the less time they have to like the less time they're spending having to like write individual assignments, then maybe they can actually like finish the reading you gave them. Yeah, exactly right. I tell my students, <laughs> I don't care if you're doing, if you're doing a topic for another class and you want to do the same topic for this class, that's fine. Just make sure it's original work because yeah. mm -hmm. professors all the time will try to publish in more than one journal off the same research project all mm -hmm. the time. So I'd like it's oh, just yeah. uh, learn how you can apply different lenses to the same material and come out with different products. That's the I that you know, that's what we're trying to get them to do. But at the same time, we penalize them for doing that. Similarly, we might say we want faculty to work together or work across disciplinary boundaries, but we're only going to give you tenure in your department if you publish within your discipline. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's that's all a based massive. on the incentives that each individual professor has and they're not geared towards the right things like you were talking about gary mm -hmm. exactly know. right it's just but my i have a little bit of a i mean it's pretty much a similar take but i taught at three places so far um i can tell you i do have i'm probably the free well yeah i'm pretty free here i'm i'm I was the most free probably when I taught at a private liberal arts college and I was the, I had the least amount of freedom when I taught at a very small municipally funded university in Kansas. And um, our intro courses, um, which is pretty much most of what I taught, um, there was basically a syllabus and a set of assignments that you had to um, give all the students. So hmm. it, it is kind of a unique thing, but, um, but yeah, definitely like changing the, like changing the system. And, and I, I do try to encourage people to do projects that, um, you know, maybe build on something else and also, but, 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 what happens to me is I get somebody who only cites psychology journals and I'm teaching a sociology class. So I, I'd like to see at least, at least yeah. one sociology yeah. paper in there. <laughs> and you can, you can put that as a requirement, right? You, you, here's our requirements. You must do this and you can do this other stuff as well. And that's fine. I mean, that's where, you know, you know, you're in a sociology class, you should learn sociology, right? You know, when I have them, put, right. you know, when I have them co-design the course, I don't. It's still sociology of sports, right? I mean, it's still the class, but how what we do in that, I leave a bit of Alaska. Hey, do you want to look at um, Squid Games? Great. Let's 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 dissect that. And you know, if you want to watch that and use that as a framework for examining sports and competition in in popular culture in society, great. All about it. Let's figure out how we can do that. I mean, could you see sociology, you know, sociology of sports and Squid Games brought together? Oh, yeah. Oh, I love that. I love oh, that. my God. 
I mean, like, I feel like that those, these are the types of things though, that you see really good content creators who maybe have a form of academic background or something. I feel like that is a video that I could see like some of the bigger, um, content creators, like do a whole deep dive into and like saying, Oh, where are the parallels here? I think I've seen so many of these where, um, folks will like dissect, um, the like larger themes of some piece of like pop culture. Um, and I don't know. And, and, and it's like, well, that does, that makes it so relevant. I'd love to see more of that in an academic setting because right. on it, on its head, it truly is like an, an academic, uh, dissection of a popular piece of pop culture that is super relevant. And it's just as relevant as if you were to do it on like a piece of like classic literature or anything that like you can't view on Netflix. And I, yeah, I, I'd love to see more of that. And I think if there were more um, papers on that kind of thing, especially at higher levels, um, that's a good way to get the general population to be like, huh, well, like I, I want to learn more about that because it's something they recognize. And that can be almost like an introductory point to get them being like, well, what, what is this? Like, what is it with sociology? Like, I'd, I'd be interested in learning more about this because, you know, it's an A language I can understand and B examining something that I am very familiar with. Renegade Cut on YouTube is an excellent uh, channel for that. They actually got me interested in kind of looking at things through the sociological lens. Oh, really? Yeah. Renegade Cut. What's very good. Renegade Cut. I'm writing it down. Yeah. I was just going to yeah, say, gonna you're say, say, you're going to have one, one. I was going to say that um philosophy already does something like that um there's a popular uh culture series of you know um you know rick and morty and philosophy and the philosophy of batman and you know it just any pop culture reference you can think of there's seinfeld ipod i mean just everything <laughs> there's a philosophy book that they've they're writing about it. And I don't think I've ever come across a sociology of, you know, Batman or anything like that, but that would be an interesting I series teach. to write. I actually it, am it, developing a sociology of comic books and there's like superheroes and supervillains or something. Right. Yeah. There's, there's plenty of like media stuff that does like a sociological analysis of, of comic book characters. Like there's one on like uh, Batman and the, the crypto fascism of vigilanteism. This is a very good uh, series. I can't remember who did it, but I'm, I can envision the guy that does these like one of these series constantly. But I'm like I'm blanking on his name, so I'm going to YouTube right now to see if I can find it because he's done so many of these like deep dives, and they're fascinating. And I, whenever I watch that, I'm just like, this could be a lecture. Like I could envision a professor using this kind of um, like foundational material as as like material for a lecture this is something i could see that like you could write papers on this and and analyzing um these different themes and elements that come up across uh mass media or just like cultural content um i would love to see someone smarter than me write a paper on it because i would read that paper i would enjoy reading that paper <laughs> i was just going you're going back to homo zygote's point they asked before what, what we can do it's it's up to me like I'm a full professor, I have tenure, it's cool. Uh, it's up to people like me to change the rules for people like Professor Q so that he's not stressed out having to publish papers, which takes time away from doing really cool stuff in the classroom because he has to worry about getting grants or getting things accepted. And so all of his focus is on what sociology he's expected to do based on the evaluation structures that have been in place for over a hundred years. Right. Uh, people like me need to change that structure because without doing so, expecting a junior faculty member to do all this cool stuff while at the same time doing the things that they're supposed to be doing, quote unquote, supposed to be doing as an academic to get tenure is just unfair. It's just like this huge unfunded mandate that increases work and increases load and it doesn't it, it, it creates burnout we should talk about my stream burnout on friday so i mean that's a big part of it is that senior faculty members administrators campus leaders 
need to make that change and there needs to be and the organizations the academic organizations need to be more proactive in being a voice for that because the passion of the younger faculty member or the junior faculty member is getting snuffed out under the weight of traditional academia and it's, it's you know so that's a big part of what we should be doing and what we need to do more of and i know that i'm privileged and that i have tenure i'm at a place that allows me to do these things it's easy for me to say but um you know needing to be more of a force for change to help others also be in a, that position and make that the norm not the uh the deviation so then what would your advice be? You know, Cause I think there's, there's a few of us here in you know, various stages of academic careers, right? You know, professor Q is, you know, sort of more on that, you know, junior faculty, uh, you know, track in current time. I'm a grad student. I think Gremlo, you're right. uh, working on a bachelor's if I remember correctly, like, you know, we, we represent, I think, you know, the start of quote unquote higher ed uh, and you are sort of, I don't want to say the, you know, the magnum opus, I'm, I'd be, you know, licking your, your, your ass a little too much there, but right. uh, you know, you're, you're at the top, like you're a professor with tenure. So yes, you know, you're in a, a place of power and privilege. You can absolutely say these things. What can we do? Yeah. Well, I, you know, tropical now, now tropical, be nice. Tropical's the mod on my channel too. So she's like, run, run. is what you need to do. <laughs> Tropical. We're not talking about that. We're too trying late. to encourage the young people. We're not trying to I'm discourage already, them. I'm too far in. I can't leave. I'm I know. I keep trying to get out. They keep pulling me back in. It's like you know, the, the worst Godfather, Godfather 3. So, yeah, I, I, I think what people – where academia has fallen down for people who want, to, who want an academic education – is providing alternative pathways out of academia for sustainable employment, right? It's like sociology is, is, is public enemy number one. And so I think what y'all are doing is the first step to show that there's an alternative way of doing it, right? You're more tapped into this stuff than I am, or Winnablin is, or, you know, I mean, yeah. you know, you're showing us the way of how to do it. So I think doing that more, pulling us in, showing how it's done, and then being vocal and telling us as allies what you need and seeing what we could do to, to help with it, you know, with whatever need levers. A job. That's we what have. I need. A job? <laughs> yeah, and you know what? Honestly, I've, I've, had, I've had conversations with adjuncts before, and I've said adjunct professor is not a career choice, right? You know, but how can we as, as academics, as people who might be in this position where people – like like Maddie, help people who can't necessarily get jobs in academia because they're not available, get opportunities elsewhere by helping translate skills that you possess into opportunities that exist. And you know, source and support, if anybody follows this channel, ACES in terms of the you know the, the career development stuff. And so and so trying to trying to help you can't create jobs out of nowhere. It's a tough market. It's getting worse. What else can we do to be creative, to live the truth that we want to live with the values that we've learned that draw us to the profession in the first place in other ways that are as meaningful or more meaningful in the long run? Mm -hmm. And we got to do, I have to do a better job at that. And associations like the Association for Applied and Clinical Sociology, Society for Applied Anthropology, <sighs> Both really good organizations that are, are, you know, value academia, but also, in you know, value the applied and the clinical work as well. That's fair. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think, you know, there's some base level advocacy that we all need to engage yeah. in. Uh, and I think that gets really, like you said, almost uh, difficult and, and oppressive in a way. Like people feel like they're jeopardizing their future if they, sure. you know, point out flaws in the system that we've all sort of voluntarily you know, decided we want to be a part of because there's something about it that attracts us to be either you know, academics or, uh, you know, if people even want to go into industry, like, okay, that's yeah. cool too. But like, you know, there's something that brought us here. I think yeah. part of being loud is convincing other people that it's okay to want to change the system because you care so much about the system, but yeah. caring about it and actually getting a job after participating in it are two different things. Cause like I, I get this question all the time, you know, what are you going to do when you graduate? Like, are you going to go work in biotech somewhere? Are you going to go in academia? And I'm just like, no, 
<laughs> like, you know, yeah. I, I, I neither of those really sound all that interesting. And even if academia sounded great, like where where's the job like that? There's right. so many other people doing what I'm doing. It's just a crapshoot. So, you know, at, at that point, like you said, there needs to be other venues that are valued. Uh, we need right. to sort of redefine what we think is output. But we can't even get to that point if it feels like, you know, the quote unquote old guard are, you know, stopping us from getting there or, you know, creating inertia in people like you, uh, Professor EXP, and sort of trying to advocate for change within the system. So maybe it just needs to come from a more almost grassroots place, right? Like the yeah. quote unquote trainee level uh, needs to almost like apply upward pressure, start punching up to really advocate for this right. change. Well, the good news is the old guard is dying. So there's always that. You can always hold on to it. You can always hold on to that. Play the long game. They will They will eventually all die off. I did put in the, in the chat an uh, organization that's really great since we have a bunch of academics around here. It's called Dragonfly Mental Health. It's a uh, mental health organization for academics. And they were, also, they were also on my podcast. Wendy Ingram is the director of it. And so as people are dealing with the stress and the uncertainty and the frustration and the rejection there you know it's a nice resource that's available that's for free to connect with others who understand are in a similar situation perhaps and that can also provide some peer support um and 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 wendy has a phd she was a bench scientist so she and she actually created the organization after one of her grad graduate student friends who was also in her program committed suicide and the need for mental health support for people like junior people in academia is really, really, really uh, important. And that's, I just wanted to make that available for folks if they wanted to check it out. Yeah. Thank you for that. That's actually a helpful resource. I think there are no a couple of people I immediately think of that could immediately benefit from this. So I'm yes. actually probably going to share that in my chat too. Soon. Yeah. <clears throat> also, depending but, on yeah. where you live, um, so here in Columbia, we have um, several mental health providers who, if you're a frontline worker, you can go and get like free therapy sessions. And so they consider academics frontline workers, just like they do teachers and, and other folks. Um, so if anyone's out there and needs that, check into it. I'm sure there's some places around. I know at my college, at least during uh, finals, like the two weeks for finals leading up to it and finals week, um, they had uh, therapy dogs uh, on. Oh, it was. And like they were we we used it, especially when you've been like just I'm someone where like when I start writing, I'll write for like 10 hours straight. So if like inspiration strikes at like 9 p.m., I'm someone I'm just like, great, I'm just going to keep going and I'll go through the night. That's not super healthy, but I will say it was better when like I'd be just stressed out, whatever. It's nice to just. uh pet pet some therapy dogs and have it lower your uh, blood pressure a bit so i think it, it's nice to see that more institutions are taking things like burnout and um just the overall like stress and anxiety that existing in academia can um cause for people it's nice to see more places start to take it a little more seriously some places i mean yeah. not all some yeah. places yeah yeah, yeah. I mean, I I, my, sorry, my, I was just like my like joke, well, kind of joke. I think a lot can be solved by having um, just dogs there. That's just me. No, That's there's a, a whole <laughs> sub-discipline in sociology. Um, Animals in society. Like, yeah, <laughs> that, that advocates for that. Or like, I, I'm so jealous when I see people that work in an office and they have like the office cat. And they're just like, oh yeah, you know, I'm, I'm having, I'm participating on a conference call and I have like this cute little cat on my lap. I love that. I'm like, God, we need to just like popularize this, make this normal. I loved like, at least when I worked in big tech, even though I hated most about the job, the great part about it, I got to bring my dog to work with me. And that was wonderful. She, uh, you got to be known, um, across not only my department, but other departments, people like my, my neighbors would keep dog treats in their desks because when Ruby was going to be in the office, they're like, Oh, I'm prepared. I want to be her friend. And they'd like <laughs> give her treats. <laughs> I need to bring my, my little dog to department meetings. The one with the very sharp, sharp claws. Yeah, who, it was a fear biter. That might be. Um, that was sick Is that what you're Right, exactly right. 
it's, it's like that episode in the Big Lebowski where they throw the the marmot into the bathtub. Oh my God. <laughs> just be like that in the department meeting. Just kind of like toss him in there and be like, "All right." Whoever survives his department chair. Five in enter. General, only one can leave. Yeah, in general, like let's just have on like school campuses have like a petting zoo. People, no, you think, know, and I think oh, yeah. something because my the meeting rooms at my campus are glass like walls. Could you imagine like having a department meeting for like the philosophy department because they're most problematic usually and just like throwing in some like pit vipers in there, shutting the door and charging, you know, streaming that. I love this. It's like not only are we using animals to like alleviate stress, but you're also using them to like incite and instill a sense of urgency in right. in getting things done. This is great. Yeah, you know, we and throw a lot of stress into like getting rid of philosophy. <laughs> Gremo, you could uh, what, your your dog's a Pomeranian, right? Yes, I have two Pomeranians. They're cute. Yeah, you, you should gorgeous. double fist your Pomeranians into a you know a class right right at finals week. Just okay. See. I didn't know what you were about to say. <laughs> <laughs> hey, oh, get, get your mind out of the gutter. Here, I'll, I'll see if right. I can so get cute. one of them. <laughs> They're like you took a big a cotton ball and attached little little toothpick legs to it and a little <laughs> nose, and that's oh. I love them so much. And when I lived in New York, one of my favorite, I have it on my Instagram somewhere. If you guys follow me on Instagram, you have to go back a ways. But when I lived in New York, there was someone who had her Pomeranian in the back of her little rolly backpack. And that oh. dog was so happy and just like delighted to be brought along to wherever. And she would just, I saw her all the time. She lived in my neighborhood somewhere. I never knew. But you'd see her on like 8th Ave, just like rolling her backpack behind her. And there was, yeah, to look just like that. Oh, a little Pomeranian's trying to kill Grimlow. You know, as we're talking about this, <laughs> I will say that, and someone, uh, Lane Bear, talked about like, you know, a cam. It made me think. One of the things I think was very helpful is when I watch streams like um, Gath Wagel or Physics OH where they're working. And students don't know what our jobs are, right? They just have no idea. And so the, the fact that a student can log on and watch a professor at work, like trying to write or trying to read an article or trying to what, do whatever and understand that it ain't easy. Mm -hmm. I think that transparency that's brought on by Twitch, the cam, right? The work cam is just a really, really wonderful advance in bridging that divide between professor lives and student lives to letting them know that the polished whatever it is you might see in front of the class yeah that's not how it normally is you know and it's it's getting behind the scenes at, at the at the challenges of writing or of reading or of synthesizing or of experimenting or working a lab bench or whatever or being an engineer or doing coding knowing the struggle is real is I think one way of breaking down that wall between um, academics and students and also the world to kind of bring people back in more into what it is we do and the value we can provide. Yeah, it, yeah, it but, humanizes you know, if they, them as well. Go ahead, they, uh, Dr. Boynwin. If they see humans doing human things, they won't pay attention to the numbers. Mm -hmm. sure. Right, and won't, won't someone please think of the data <laughs> Please. I was streaming for Please. five hours and I got eight sentences written. Let's see what kind of ratio we can create with that. We need boring math professor back to run those numbers. I mean, part of this is also the the system itself because I see like I see this in my students where they're like they're like, oh, I'm like two points away from an A minus. What? Can I just get those two extra points? Like they, they, they're so. And, and a lot of times, this is what's really weirded me out about teaching. There'll be students who want um, full credit for an assignment, and when I go in and and figure it out, it, it turns out that that actually doesn't even impact their grade at all. And um, there's just this this we've almost gamified the system with the, you know, mm -hmm. online grade book and everything. And it's, you know, all about getting the high score. Right. Yep. Well, that's, again, that's why they are sometimes resistant or um, uneasy about stepping outside the box a little bit and make like defining their own parameters for like a project because they're, it's all been gamified. And if you ask someone like, Hey, define like, you decide what this level is, like what you do in the level. They're like, uh, just 
just tell me what I need to do and I'll do it. Cause that's just how mm. they've been trained to, yeah. to approach things. I will say I have figured out a really interesting trick and I've told Marcus about this um, and how to like really throw a wrench in that metric, the, the impact factor metric. Mm -hmm. And so uh, whenever I publish something, I try to write a corresponding public facing article, like in the conversation or, um, you know, for some kind of more journalistic outlet that's based on my research, but I always cite it in that article so it links back to the the actual like the research paper once it's published and i didn't know this until it, it was serendipity complete serendipity um but i found out that it was impacting the impact factor boosting the numbers and so so um i'm always looking for now i'm just starting to look for things that are like how can I like throw a monkey wrench into the system and use the system kind of against itself? If that makes sense. Oh yeah. Well, impact factors. I don't know if you all know this, but um, you know, part of it is how many times your articles are cited by other people and other journals. Um, it doesn't, it, the impact factor doesn't take into account whether those citations are absolutely savaging your writing and your theory and your article or whether it's praising it like it's the next coming, right? It's completely context blind in that right. sense. And you can have an article that's been written and published and everybody's just dunking on it and it will still get boosted by the impact factor. Right. I actually have a funny story about that. When I was doing my dissertation, uh, I had a committee member who got very upset that I did not choose her to be my advisor and chose somebody else. And so this was on my birthday, actually. I did my you know pre preliminary proposal, right, for my dissertation. And mm -hmm. she's like, you can't, this isn't good enough because you didn't cite my work enough. Right. And so I'm not going to pass you. I said, okay, that's fair. I, so then I went back and I cited everything she said that was wrong. And from mm -hmm. that point on, anytime I did a presentation on that topic, I would say, and so-and-so says such and such, which is wrong. Because she said I had to cite her more. So that's, that's, I, that's what I did. She couldn't say that I did it. Right. She didn't say I had to agree. She said I had to cite her more. So I'm like, I she wasn't like, you to a cross praising me enough. Yep. <laughs> just a site to site. Yeah, and she was so, wrong. Yeah. Talk about you know, gamification. Yeah, be careful what you wish for. I, I went back, read your stuff more carefully, pulled it out, and said, nope, that's not actually accurate. So that's you're exactly that right. I just need to be more direct with you. Instead of saying, like, no, I need you to cite me, I'll be like, this, um, I feel like there's a significant lack of, of lavishing me with praise and celebrating right my contributions, mm -hmm. um, just to be transparent. So if you could, um, just make me look good in your paper. Well, she would have ego. 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 I, ego. <laughs> I had a, a professor do that to me in grad school and he's, he's notorious for this. If you have to cite his work and praise him. Because I love when, I love when of, professors put their own, I love when professors put their own books in their like course reading materials. I'm just like, eh, all right. And then they're at like one of the papers you're supposed to write is like, oh, like, you know, what's the opinions or like, you know, responses to this book. And I'm like, I'm guessing you don't want me to like shit all over the ideas you like outlined in this book. Huh? <laughs> just. Right. It's, it's all a grand place. exercise in narcissism. Yeah, it almost makes you wonder if there's some sort of like complex there. I mean, now we need like a psychiatrist or something in here to really dig down, <laughs> figure that one out. <clears throat> Oof, all there right. is. Short answer is there is. <laughs> you know, so a friend of mine once said in academia, he's like, we might be fighting over peanuts, but they're my peanuts, damn it, and I want them. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that I mean, sounds that's exactly like Jordan Peterson. Oh, what? Oh. 
Yeah, oh, Grumlow, come on, do it. Just oh, well, I, I uh, saw Jordan a video Peterson on retired. Twitter of him crying earlier, so I'm gonna go watch that like immediately when we're done here. We're gonna have a good laugh at it. I don't know. And Dragon yeah, of yeah. Chaos. Yeah, are, are you are you like up to date with what he what he just did in resigning from U Toronto? What is it what? over the gay conversion what did therapy? He do? It wasn't over the, the therapy. It was over a. Di like over like a DEI initiative, he, he basically said like you know they're destroying academia and they I want can't, women like... in academia. How are we yeah, supposed literally. to focus he... on you know standardized testing while women are wearing rouge? <laughs> <laughs> he literally quit over that yeah. dude. No, he, he's funny. taking the uh, the exiled oh, academic approach. What a fragile yeah. man. My my therapist man. left me to go teach at University of Toronto. <laughs> And well, there's one new position open. Yeah, I was gonna say, I'm like, did they mention story. like? When well, he's like, I'm leaving to go teach at University of Toronto. I said, so you're leaving me? He's like, it's not about you. I said, well, clearly we haven't solved that issue yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're, you're willing like, yeah, to deal maybe I with the cultural neo Marxist, then go for it, Bucko. Yeah, he's teaching clinical social work up there, so maybe he knows this guy. I told them. I love it. <laughs> I just love that Jordan Peter. Oh my God, he he like praises what like clean your room as he like rants from his uh, office that like behind him is just like a disaster, a disaster. He just doesn't give off vibes of someone who's thriving, you know. I mean that that's what happens when your diet consists of nothing but cuts of beef and benzodiazepines. Oh he that's actually has a, a I don't know if you um listen to uh Behind the Bastards but they did a, a special yes. on Jordan Peterson and uh his collection despite being a, a a rampant like red scare propagandist uh has a massive massive collection of Soviet artwork within his like wrecked room really? which is weird because his like uh contemporary in like Slavo Žižek a, a dumpster diving raccoon of a man lives a very clean life like in his home has no soviet uh like um iconography within his house but is the fundamental opposite of uh jordan peterson you have to know the enemy i do this guy is and i'm glad i didn't that's awesome <laughs> Don't be afraid of women, guys. It's okay. Don't like, listen have to women her. in your spaces. We're we're all right. Man. We're all right. <laughs> well, he's gotta know something. He has a podcast. And True. nobody has a podcast who doesn't know. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> something. I mean, there's That's so many right. podcast supplies at Target now. I think I think it's over. <sighs> Four hundred thousand Patreon subscribers does a guy lie. with a podcast. That, your Jordan Peterson's so good. Thank like you. it, it throws me off. I can't do him crying, which I'm working on. Which is why you're <laughs> yeah. doing the character study and and researching. Yeah, the, of course. The imitation would be better if you were holding the Pomeranian. Oh well, they're gone now. <laughs> <laughs> that would actually put the cherry on top of the impression if you were stroking the Pomeranian. Yeah. While <laughs> while, while talking about while talking like that, I think that would. Yeah. That would be the coup de gras. Yeah. Sight lines from James Bond. <laughs> but, and why talk I've about how like uh... you, Mr. Bond? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's while while discussing how like letting women into academic spaces will lead to the fall of of Western civilization. Um, yeah, because it's doing it's it's doing so well now. Right. <laughs> I mean, like watching people like talk about the fall of Western civilization is like watching white supremacists on Jerry Springer. I'm like the message doesn't fit the content, the you know, the imagery. You can't sit there and talk about yourself being a superior race while at the same time doing whatever you're doing about who's the baby daddy. It doesn't yeah. work that way. Mm -hmm. It's com it's completely incongruous. So if you're gonna sit there and talk about women causing the fall of Western civilization while Western civilization is burning, you might want to check, you know, where you're at. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, if if your version of like higher academia can be taken down by just like some women's in your spaces, then maybe it deserves. Yeah, to fall. it sounds like it was overdue. <laughs> well, yeah, that's the idea it, about miscegenation, right? The idea that the one drop rule in race was one drop of black blood will result in a person being black, being considered black. I'm like, well, hell, that must be some powerful stuff. That black blood and the white blood must be so weak. <laughs> Because right. if one drop of it is going to cause you to become black, 
then I guess that white stuff isn't all cracked, all you're saying it's cracked up to be. Careful, so, we're on Twitch. But, you're doing anti-white discrimination right now. Yeah, we're, we're about to be banned. <laughs> Well, I actually, oh my God. I, actually, no, they, I can't, so I can't, I can't do that because I was already called uh, uh, an an able-bodied white male by somebody, even though I am Arab American. So. Oh, okay. So that's we, weird that's how that works, legitimacy. isn't it? <laughs> yeah, right. My twenty three and me. I discovered <laughs> yeah. I'm one per one percent Coptic Egyptian. <laughs> Who knew? My dad oh. did it too, and his was yeah. Too, on my dad's side, he has like two percent or whatever, and he, I mean, of course, he's like blonde hair, like white, blue, like white blonde hair, blue eyed. And he's like, yo, who knew? But yeah, isn't that, isn't that knew. funny? Isn't that funny where they're like, oh, this stuff. It's the same thing when they complain about Mexican immigrants, where they're both like taking all the jobs, but also lazy. And it's like, mm, right. can't have both. So which one is it, guys? Just, like, just one stereotype for consistency. Yeah. It has tropical saying ethnicity and race are two separate things. And I've taught like 25 years on race and uh, the concept of race and ethnicity. And it's, it's a whole other thing. But yeah, it's. It gets silly because of, again, going back, and I'm going to bring it all the way back around, the illusion of concreteness, right? Whether it's numeric, it's a social construct, right? Race is a social construct. Ethnicity, in many respects, is a social construct that we yep. have you know, convinced ourselves has some realness. And as W.I. Thomas said, things are real if they're real in their consequences, right? People whoa, whoa, whoa. perceive them you as real, they'll be real there. in their consequences. What's that? It's the Thomas and Thomas theorem because his wife helped him write it. But most people think it's just the Thomas theorem because he was the guy and he got all the credit. There we go, the Thomas as theorem. As he should. Pomeranian. Yeah, so, you know, we, we, need to, we need to convince ourselves that the reality in which we construct it is not the only reality that's possible. Absolutely. Right? How do we get out of that? And that, that's the work y'all are doing right now. Yeah. This is why I love when I'm like, there are professors that we have on this because I'm like, no matter what tangent we go on, they're going to tie it right back up because they're really <laughs> good at that. Oh, so yeah, it like is, nice and neatly. It is what I do on my stream. And we bounce all over the place. <laughs> and it's, it's, a, it's a, it, it seems like a train wreck, but tropical keeps me on path. And uh, usually we tie it back around at some point. <laughs> It, it's very a solid mod team. I have to say, I have learned yeah. um, so much watching your stream and watching Dwindlin and, and some of the other characters around. That's really made me a much better teacher. Like, there's just little tricks that I pick up here and there. So I appreciate that. That's nice. Can you <laughs> write a letter so I can put it in my annual review? That'd be awesome. Oh yeah, <laughs> I'm great at that. Let's do it. His streams were very pog, signed Professor yeah. Q. K E K W. Poggers. <laughs> this guy is based. No, seriously. Yeah. I want right. seriously. I, I want you to do this. Can you write me a, a letter a, a positive review as if it's a Twitch chat? Oh. <laughs> I must have this and I must frame this. I will put I it on have... university letterhead even. <laughs> yes, please. And I want all I want emotes, everything. I mean, I don't know how you kids sit around here talk with this language. You know, someone said, you know, I said something about Michael Harry. He's like, he's so base. I'm like, is that good? I don't know if that's a... People hate board of review. I... <laughs> they stay I'm up. still I'm still unclear at the the proper application of dead ass as a word. Um, yeah, I don't and know. I just, I just like, that's one I haven't touched. I'm like, mm, I, I'm, no. I'm not super confident in my application of that. You know but who, there's other ones. Who I learned from, I, my nephew, I've, I've been following him, you know, I was not really interested in him until he was like around 15 or 16. That's when they get fun. Um, but I was like, why is he into all this leftist stuff and where is he picking it up? And that's when I found out about Twitch and like all the different communities that exist. And so anytime I'm like, hey, what's Keck mean? I text him and I'm like, hey, what's what's Poggers mean? Or what's like, what's this? And he's like, <laughs> you know, he fills me in. So um, thanks yeah. to him. That's awesome. <laughs> Good to have a Zoomer in your life that you can use as like a, a source, lingo source encyclopedia. Whatever. Yeah. I would ask my kids what these things mean, but they don't talk to me. 
Um, well, <laughs> that's that lasts only for a little bit. They'll they'll come around once they um exit. Like once they go off to college, then all of a sudden it's like, wait, my parents are free. No, and... no, no. What it is is they need money, so they right. maintain relationships Look, to get you know. sure. Which is why you know you have leverage, so you can get those conversations, <laughs> and then they can like have food that's not ramen. Or like the same thing of peanut butter that they've just been putting on various things that they've taken from the cafeteria. So. Mm, good old manager special chicken. <laughs> the secret ingredient is salmonella. Mm. Mm. <laughs> or at least that's what you find out, you know, several hours later after you eat it. Yeah. <clears throat> um, all right. Uh, I actually, I have one sort of, I don't want to say like personal, but I guess it's more from like my work experience. Professor EXP, you mentioned, I think when you were doing your introduction, uh, you, you spent some time sort of, uh, doing research into medical errors and documentation. Of oh yeah. That? Yeah. Um, I, I asked you this because I actually spent uh, the better part of two years as a medical scribe. I don't know how familiar oh, you, you are. Really? With that. Yeah. Jeez, that's <laughs> but, funny. Uh, I, I could probably, you know, I think I've uh, mentioned this to Gremlo too, but I think more specific to documentation, I could tell you all sorts of war stories about some yeah, of the yeah. just shit that physicians are yeah. forced to do by virtue yeah. of being, uh, you know, computer operators and doctors at yeah. the same time. Yeah. Uh, but I guess like maybe it's just as a like an interesting story to kind of cap off the uh, the segment here. What's the most wild slash insane medical error you've ever encountered in your research? I mean, I didn't. So I wrote a paper on this. It's in the Sociology and Health of, of Health and Illness. And this actually goes like to what, like what Grimwald talks about. It's not so much error. It's what was the value of the medical transcriptionist. And so these uh, primarily women were, I was told when I first started doing this research quite by accident, that they, all they do is type down what a doctor says. And in, if anybody tells you something like that, you know automatically they're wrong especially when it comes to work. I know right now we have, uh, you know, Mario's in the chat and he'll say he's just a car detailer. He's, he comes to my stream a lot. And if you watch his stream, you understand that there's a competency, there's a knowledge work, there is a proficiency that's been accumulated over 30 or 40 years where he knows how to do things that, that we won't know how to do. He is a craftsman at his craft, right? And so I know, I know that they were diminishing the work of these women. So I'm like, okay, so like, what do these women do? There was no academic research on medical transcription. There was no research on how medical records were made. Nothing. It was a black box. And so we we're like, okay, let's have to take a look. Now, most of the people who ran these companies said these women were not part of the revenue cycle, which was weird because as I would tell people, doctors don't generate revenue, documents do. What a doctor does doesn't generate revenue. It's what a document says a doctor does. And so anybody who's part of that revenue production, that, that document production process is part of the revenue cycle. And so all we did was this very simple experiment, you know, quasi experiment. At a, from a hospital, we took a doctor dictation. We transcribed it verbatim using conversation analytic notation. Exactly what was said. Then we took the, the voice recognition draft that was created with the errors. And then we took the finished medical transcriptionist document and we said, which one has more value? And they said, well, clearly the one that, that, that the transcriptionist did, I said, there's your value add. Hmm. The work, it's easy to see the value of the work in looking at what it's like when it's absent. And so the, there's all kinds of examples of like, you know, people saying left or right or people I had one doctor who said, I only will say obese when I know a patient is not, or fat when a patient's non-compliant, and I'll make sure they see the screen when I say it. And I had one doctor say, I'll only dictate in front of a patient when I don't think there's anything wrong. If I'm worried there's something wrong, um, I won't dictate in front of the patient, to which I said, well, if, uh, if I see you as a doctor and you don't dictate in front of me, I should be worried. He's like, yeah, be worried. <laughs> and so you see how doctors come to grips with the technology and you see how doctors try to integrate it into their work and how it transforms and shapes their work. And then you see how people like transcriptionists are so underappreciated and undervalued and marginalized 
And that the thing that I could do as an academic with my PhD was try to give voice to who they were. And it wasn't so much like the errors that I found, but it was one of the things they would say is they would tell a doctor, doctor, I want to make sure I heard this correctly when they know the doctor was wrong hmm. because they were doing gender work and emotional work in the course of doing their interactions with the doctor. Or if a doctor really pissed them off, they would transcribe verbatim, which means they would transcribe everything the doctor said as the doctor said it just to piss them off. <laughs> Again, nice. it's like an act of resistance. It's like a, what's called an Italian strike, work to rule. Like, fine, you want me to transcribe verbatim? I'll do it and make him look like a complete jackass. So it was a Here way of getting uh, epic. And, um... Every error that was there, they would put in. Right? And so you really got to see how they were knowledge workers and not manual labor. Not that there's anything wrong with manual labor, but manual labor is knowledge work. Full stop. Yeah. Right? And so that was like the, the premise of the research was to understand their world, their work, their comp. I'm still involved with the organizations, um, the transcription organizations, you know, not just, you know, supporting and helping and giving consult when necessary. So the, it's a tremendous profession, tremendous people who are, care about their jobs. And the fact that they were underappreciated is just one more example of labor not being valued. I would like to see some kind of, uh, I, I don't know, uh, explainer, video, whatever, to kind of, in layman's terms, explain the intersections of physical, emotional, and knowledge labor, so that uh, the kind of misconceptions that we often have yeah. are uh, kind of uh, scrubbed away. Yeah, there's some like really good work ethnographies out there, and I... You know, there's a really nice book called Shop Class is Soulcraft. Um, and there's one, there's a psychologist named Mike Rose, I think, not Rose, but Rose, S R O S E, who talks about the psychology of the mind and, and work. And they actually dip into, you know, like that, like the Mike Rose book goes into a chapter on welding, right? And the artistry of welding, mm -hmm. right? And like really understanding the lived experiences or Winnebun's world, the phenomenological experience of embodied labor. Which is See, a really beautiful thing. That's that's something that sociology can do to help get us out of this weird political divide right now. Is like giving voice to the the you know the lower these lower class positions. Um, that's a big thing I've been like kind of preaching about lately. That's why I like yeah. watching like Mario Maserati stream or other streamers where they're working because I study work. I'm an ethnographer of work. I study workplaces. I studied liquor stores as a graduate student. Then I studied distributed software development teams. I studied medical transcription. I studied police interrogation. Um, and I've studied probably a few other things. And, you know, UX, you know, workers. So, you know, getting at the competencies, the, the underestimated, undervalued, and marginalized populations, that's a Joe Madison quote who's on SiriusXM, who's a sociologist. Getting at their lived experiences and giving voice to their value is, I think, what sociology is about. Have you ever um, done any any looks into like a telemarketer call center type yeah, work? Yeah, I have. Interesting. I have, yeah, I have. I'd be yeah, interested actually, to pick your brain on that sometime. Yeah, by all means, I actually redesigned a call center training program for a large dental lab um, based upon the competencies of the workers and not based on some uh, external standardized consultant led um framework okay yeah we got to talk sometime yeah i think you guys dream roughly at the same time so mm -hmm. maybe you could do like a joint i'd love thing. that yeah. that'd be great because i'm all i i i've done a, i've done a bunch of work around call centers as well fascinating That'd be incredible. One of the things I love, um, there's a, a Twitter that is run by a, um, a agricultural work union. Um, and some of the things yeah, they farm do. Farm workers union. Yep. Yes. Yes. And I love what they're doing with their Twitter, the content they're putting out there, because it's showcasing not only just how skilled this kind of labor is, and it, it is like high skill labor in order to be an efficient, effective um, farm worker, but it's also telling the like stories of these people who are out there each day so that you're connecting it. You're connecting, you know, a, a, it's not just this nebulous 
far off othered um, group of people who work on things that like not like have direct impacts on our lives so that they connect the personal stories, the actual um, the kind of work they do that is highly skilled. And then they also will tie it back in with, and this is the result. Here's the um, end result of, and the culmination of what all right. their work contributes. And I think, oh, I, I, I freaking, I love that Twitter. It did you such a good job. I put it into the chat, the, the Twitter link for them into the chat, if anyone wants to see it. Mm -hmm. It's so good. Um, mm. When we were having, there was a dumb like Twitch only discourse going on where they were talking about skilled workers versus not. And I think I, I retweeted a lot of their stuff being like, tell me, tell me this is unskilled labor. Tell me this is low skilled labor. Like, absolutely not. It, it is high skilled. It takes time and training to get these workers up to a level where they're efficient. Um, and that's, yeah, it, it's just, I, I think as a society, it would be great to, see a shift in consciousness in terms of how people perceive that kind of labor. And I think stuff like that, where it's front and center, helps to um, further that perception and change the way people view those kinds of things. Absolutely right. Absolutely. I second that. I mean, well, they probably make more than me. So I know my, my nephew who's in... Um, <laughs> He's in the bricklayers union. He he makes way more than than anyone in my family. So just goes to show you. <laughs> as I tell as I tell my students, our business students, you can't offshore plumbing, right? <laughs> I'm like all of you, if you know the more knowledge work, quote unquote, you know it is the more digitized it can be. The more your job is at risk. And, I have uh, one yep. better for you that you can use as a joke in your class. Sure. Um, so in the small town in Indiana that I grew up in, there was a um, truck and it said the sweet smell of success on the back of it. And his he cleaned septic systems out. So Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, I, I, people's jobs, it's, you know, so much of our work is tied into our identity and understanding the lived experiences and also understanding how people collaborate and try to work together in these environments so and i and i taught work classes on working organizations and i taught ethnography of work you know it's getting into these worlds that people occupy because they they are meant to be meaningful not always but sometimes but also appreciating the craftsmanship for any work that's done because people at the end of the day i think just want to be seen they want to be valued they want to be appreciated they want to be listened to, seen, understood, right? And so the more that we can do that as ethnographers, right, studies of cultures and groups, and as sociologists or social scientists or whomever, um, that's why I got so drawn to workplace studies, because it's, uh, whether it's lab work, bench work, great work by a, a person named Karen Norsatina called Epistemic Cultures uh, that studied, you know, lab work. Um, or looking at, you know, so like, like watching Physics OH, I'm like, I don't know what the hell he's talking about. I have like literally no idea what he's talking about, but it's fun to watch. <laughs> it's just kind of cool to see him do the thing and be so excited about it. And that's just a gift. It's a privilege to be able to watch people do what they love. There is something uh, enthralling about uh, someone who is an expert either in knowledge or in craftsmanship, just watching them talk about whatever it is they're passionate about. You know, you talk to someone who's mm -hmm. followed, I don't know, like a, a band since they got together and since they started touring and has been following their entire career, the the way that they wax poetically about whatever it is they're passionate about, it's, uh, it's captivating. It certainly is. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, I think uh, we're we're all pretty much going to co-sign on that one. Yeah. Um, are Are there any other, I guess, uh, burning questions we want to uh, ask and address while we have uh, the lovely Professor Exp here tonight? Yeah. Love. <laughs> That's my bedtime. I'm like you know, the old folks. Yeah. <laughs> like pushing it. Not like these late night Pumpkin streamers time. over this here. This is way too long after they serve the Jello at the home for me to be out. Usually, <laughs> usually oh, it's Jello it, night. 
It was Jello night. It was Jello and Bingo, and you got extra Jello. Wow. You got Bingo. It was very exciting. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Jello and Bingo. Right. Honestly, I mean, I'm not even yeah. in an old person home yet, and that sounds great. I'm like, I would go. I would go to that. I would right? go to that event on a Friday night. Absolutely. Oh yeah. Bingo's great. Tropical knows. And Tropical then, say Jello and Bingo's at five p.m. She knows. Yeah, well, yeah it's throw. like, and then you throw you throw Jello into the mix. I'm like sold. Yes. <laughs> like we would play a Jello bingo shot. in Vegas um, as grad students. That was like our thing to go because basically you there was one you could get like you got like two drinks or something, and we would yeah. we would just get a little snockered, and eventually the bingo cards start kind of moving around, yeah. and uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it was fun. It was interesting. But we were the youngest people there. For oh, yeah. I'm trying to get my stream sponsored by AARP, and it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> but it's, I'm working on it. If I got they have my the card. energy to send everybody mailers, they could sponsor a Twitch stream. I got my card. I exactly. Got my card. They, got, they got the money. Postage is not cheap. We know you have the sponsorship money, AARP. And, my, and with my, by my membership, I got my uh, trunk organizer for my groceries. Yay. That's, that's not nothing. That's great. That sounds. <laughs> right? That's not nothing. Yeah, now your groceries up, the, uh, are organized. What a uh, oh, what a revelation! After yeah, I get I done uh, arguing with the people at the uh, counter over the coupons, <laughs> then I can take my groceries <laughs> out and I can uh, and I can what put them world. back in my car and keep them organized. Absolutely. What a <laughs> how long? How long until you get the branded uh, pill separator where you have a little box for every day of the week to put your pills in? You said and how long? As if it hasn't Thank happened. You very much. <laughs> it's already there it's already sitting on the shelf i feel Absolutely. like millennials are going to be early adopters of that just because we um have so many anxiety issues that like we're already on like so many things i'm speaking for about myself of course but like i, I feel like there's going to be a big market yeah i was gonna say i'm good there's going to be a big market for younger folks and uh the daily pill thing <laughs> so you I think have that's one an untapped market What's that? You're a Pomeranian. I mean, of course you have a pillbox. Yeah. I think, I think you get them when you get. I think it come. They come together. As a yeah. Set. yeah. I have the pillbox, and then I keep like my morning yeah. supplements, like just at my desk. Absolutely nice. right. Nice. Love it. Real boomer hours out here now. I know. This is like. I feel like there's a different Boomers vibe. Are just being tough, being a boomer, man. Tough, tough being on Twitch, right? Boomer, boomer, being a boomer, apparently, and being oh, like on Twitch. The abuse. Tell me about it. Just the <laughs> nonstop abuse. There's, there's For, so much. So forget much. about this, like, you know, anti like white racism nonsense. What about the ageism that I have to deal with all the time on my stream? <laughs> the most oppressive. Do you know how many people. times I hear boomer every single day? <laughs> every single time. Well, someone please think oh. of those four boomers. <laughs> Not a boomer. <laughs> I am not a no. boomer. I get and called, it's ages, I get called and you're all me. You're streaming late. I get called a boomer, and bedtime. I'm 33. I'm just like, excuse you. You just skipped right over Gen X. I'm a millennial. No, anyone, <laughs> if you're like over the age of like 24 for a lot of um, Twitch viewers, that, that firmly puts you in the, the boomer category. <laughs> so basically it's more of a social construct and a state of mind these days than an actual generational indicator i am yeah. going to Absolutely. petition twitch about their anti-hate policy and updating it about ageism <laughs> because i'm feeling very very threatened right now yeah you need to get the, the boomer emote removed it's it's just it's time <laughs> yeah what's the over under on large streamers ban because of the new ageism policy right <laughs> But then again, to... who would be protected? Because there are obviously millennial uh, streamers who would fall into that boomer mindset. So we would have to have a real discussion about, you know, who falls within that protected class. Oh, big time. I'm, a, I'm what they call a geriatric millennial. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm going to get hate rated. Was it because you're a race? No, man, my age. Yeah. Oh, damn. That hurts. <laughs> They were just spamming my chat with hearing aids and walkers. I don't know what was going on. <laughs> and Geritol. Yes. It was scary. I didn't know. I had to check the whole thing down. It's just a bunch of Pepe's with the walker with the tennis balls on exactly. it. Exactly. Pepe through my walkers. Chat. Pepe's with like the long like cones for the hearing aid. <laughs> Absolutely. It's like, that wasn't right. 
That's we'll not see. right at all. Now there's an untapped market for dementia emotes. I would have, I would have been really offended if I could have read the, the, the text mm -hmm. size and I knew what they said. I would have been really offended. <laughs> Since I didn't have my readers on, I didn't know what the hell was going on. Chatterino's oh. font settings are ageist. They're absolutely right. ageist. I'm like, what? I can't. And then you got to make the face, right? You got to make the old person trying to read face, which is kind of like, you got to tilt the head back and open up the mouth like, oh, what? What are they saying? Yeah. I don't know. What, uh, I don't know what's going on. And then Tropical's that like, also, I don't know what's going on either. That also works for people who um, need glasses, but just haven't seen an optometrist in a few years. And have yeah. trouble reading street signs. Mm -hmm. I figured out this week I need a new prescription. Same. The struggle is real. The struggle is real. Just go to CVS and just get like, just, just increase your prescription and just get like the big fat like leopard rims because that's why i want to see buena Blin right on the next stream <laughs> get the tortoise shells oh my oh my absolutely <sighs> oh shit yeah well yeah i mean right, before, if i could before. get away with it i would buy a pair from cvs or something that i think you could rock it no of course, oh, yes, I have an astigmatism, and I've got to use bifocals. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Wonder Boy's going to have the gray slick glasses from the 1985 tour. <laughs> when are we bringing back magnifying glasses? That's what I want. The hmm. mm. interesting, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Wearing a Sherlock yeah. Holmes detective outfit—that's uh, required right. to operate the magnifying uh, glass. There are so many like police TV shows where they're supposedly detectives haven't seen one magnifying glass. I'm like, yeah, yeah, how hard that? do you really want to solve this crime? Obviously not. Not very. You know, wow. Yeah. I had to register a product for a warranty and I could not even read it with a magnifying glass. <laughs> this has happened. This happened yesterday. <laughs> this is I'm not kidding you. I'm not kidding you at all. The print uh, was so small. I've handed things to my kids and said, read this. It's, it's, it's that time. My own, yeah. I don't know what it says. Dad. I don't hard. Daddy's <laughs> tired. I've worked hard all day. I, I can't work that hard to read this pill box. Am I taking the right ones for my rheumatiz? No? Okay. My kid's a different species. He doesn't know how to read. <laughs> Bark. Can you bark? Yeah, Is this he, the right pill? He, he barks. He looks a bit more quizzically than barking, but yeah. Yeah, I don't know if they make a service dog that like also performs that task. Fetch <laughs> Daddy's yeah. Nexium. Some it's narration a for you. <laughs> you just have to train the service dog in the pharmacy, then it'll know what to do. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, it goes to pharmaceutical school. It gets his pharmacy degree. <laughs> it passes all the, you know, it, it it's um. It gets it has it stays up to date in terms of its like uh whatever it needs. Yeah, it the goes to continuing education units and accreditation. Accre yeah. And you know, oh it renews its license. So yeah, as yeah. long as you have a dog that has a, its pharmacy license up to date, you're fine. Then sure. I'm just That's imagining so all of the conventionally attractive 30 something uh pharmaceutical reps at the convention who, <laughs> you know, gave up on real that's estate that's where you see all the pomeranians yeah, yeah that's where you see all the pomeranians yeah they... i'm already halfway there so i mean you know <laughs> i just need to get a, a pencil skirt and i'm there uh -huh. <laughs> when you can tell your dog to go fetch daddy's uh, oxy and i'm counting the number of pills left <laughs> so don't dip into it like last time <laughs> Oh, Daddy's oh. counting. He knows how many are there. I already have to get an early refill oh. from the last two you ate. <laughs> exactly. <right. laughs> and then maybe the dog will bring over the pill pocket so Buna Bun will take him. Uh, be more compliant this time. Just hide the pill in the snack. And it's fine. I need now a pill pocket. Yeah. Oh, oh, my, oh my. Dead ass. They're dope. Is that right? Did I do that right? Did I do that right? Is that right? Yeah, what? you got it. I think so. <laughs> that was pretty good. I think <laughs> Okay. I didn't know if I was doing that right. Oh, Jesus Use Christ. it in a sentence. I think oh, it's Jesus. just a replacement for like, where I would normally say for real or like actually, like this is for real. They're like, they dead ass said, or like they actually, they said this for real. Yeah. Legit. And I think that's, that's what, what we it call is. Legit. But... Legit, right? Legit. Yeah, dead legit. ass. For real. real. I think I still say legit. Yeah, that may be that. Oh God, is me saying legit? Is that me dating myself? Word. Or? Word. 
Oh. We used to say that. Remember we used to say that? I word? feel like that's out of yeah. vogue. Right? These days, uh, like Zoomers that's... are like dead ass for real, for real on a stack, hundred percent. Like that's their on like. God on jaw. Yeah, on or jaw. Or they say bet. I still don't really know when you say bet. Oh, that I know. That's old. That's I, that that I know. That I that that's an old train. That's that, that's an old phrase. Where they're like, where they say you're like, oh, are you really gonna do that? And they're like, bet. I miss people yeah, calling bet. things what? tight. Like that's that tight. I do know. Yeah. I know how to use bet in a sentence. Okay. That's old school. Okay. OG. Yeah. OG AARP talk right there. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I really have that to sponsorship. Go, in, go into that retirement home where we're going to hear that vernacular just in mass from every single person. <laughs> yep. I'm thinking about like uh, ambulance chaser advertisements that are going to take place on like Instagram pop up ads in like 20 years. <laughs> Have you taken this medicine? You might be eligible for a large remuneration on a stack. <laughs> <laughs> fat stacks. You yeah. might be eligible for stat, fat stacks. Yeah. Bet. You are a loved Jet one. Ass. <laughs> you yeah. or the Jet fam ass. might uh, be eligible for a remun remuneration for osteoporosis or mesothelioma. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, Christ. Yeah, I know. This took a turn. <laughs> It always does. It always does. Yeah. It's when you know hey, something good's happening. It was a good time, though. Exactly. I mean, that goes to show you how uh, we don't get to do this shit in academia. It's uh, yeah. all professionalism all the time. We, yeah. we get events sometimes. I hear you. <clears throat> Not in my all department, right. but... Yeah. <laughs> yeah I'll, I'll speak for my program. <laughs> <clears throat> all right, everybody. Uh I think this this might be a pretty decent place to yeah. wrap it up, but uh, uh, Professor EXP, since you were the, the guest of honor tonight, go ahead and uh, take another opportunity to you know, shout out your channel, shout out anything oh, else you've got yeah. going on. If you want more great content like this, uh, you should go somewhere else. <laughs> um, yeah, you, can go to, you can go to Professor EXP on Twitch. I'll be streaming tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock uh, Eastern time, so come hang. And then Saturday night, 7 uh, we were playing the Stanley Parable. I don't know what we're doing next. Um, I don't know. That's a great game, by the way. We had a lot of fun with that. Um, but yeah, if we have any suggestions about good games to play that have a good social message, I actually want to do Detroit Becomes Human. Detroit Becomes Human. Disco Come Elysium. Detroit. What's that? Disco Elysium. You'll love it. There That's we go. Too. Disco Elysium. So we're taking suggestions to do the game design analysis and the sociological integration and... You can always check me out at Experience by Design podcast as well. Beautiful. I think that's a <clears throat> very succinct plug for all of your content. I will also co-sign Disco Elysium. Wonderful game. Be, be, make sure you have your readers on, though. There, there's a decent amount of reading. Huh? What did he say? I don't know what it, it says. Voice oh, now. I can't read that. Get down here and read this for me. It has a voiceover now. <laughs> what did you yeah, say, Sonny? <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, um, and Maddie, I know you were talking sort of in the, the pregame chat about uh, your contact from SFUSD. Uh, what what are the odds for next week? Just out of curiosity, I I would say they're pretty good. I have to check in with her. I I she felt really bad for having to uh, cancel, but as you can imagine, things are crazy in uh, public schools right now. So I think the odds are pretty good. Let me, I'll, I'll get back to you on that, but I really hope we can uh, have Annie on. She's been on my stream before. People who watch my stream know her, love her. Um, and she would have loved this entire conversation because she is currently in, um, in ed U or an ed D program. Oh, really? Okay, so, cool. Mm -hmm. Nice. Right on. So fingers crossed, we will have that to look forward to to next week on the next meeting of Ministry of Science. Uh, everybody, thank you for being here once again. I uh, very much appreciate the, uh, what, almost three hours of very good conversation. It was a little bit more high octane than before in terms of the, the pacing, but I think that was for the better. We, we covered a lot of stuff. Oh, yeah. It was a good time. Thanks for having me. It's a blast. All right, guys. I'll, Thanks for uh, hanging out, people. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, uh, I'll talk to you guys in the chat. Likewise, yeah, we will uh, see you all hopefully next week.